on October 28th about. Uh, students had the amazing opportunity of attending Women in Engineering and Coding Day at UMass Amherst, as well as a new form of morning announcements at Holyoke High School North Campus, which are online on a YouTube live stream. And tomorrow is World Toilet Day. Uh, just out of curiosity, what does that mean? So, uh, World Toilet Day is something that we are um, trying to celebrate in contemporary issues as well as the Community and Global Studies Academy, where we celebrate the toilet and uh, global sanitation for all. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so. Moving on to Dean Campus, Mr. Perez. Um, everything's been good, and last week, we we're supporting the cause of woman abuse, so we we're saying fight back, respect, and we posted it, and the whole school was on it. We all had <coughs> these things to say, like support, hearts, and then, yeah, this week is Spirit Week once again, and I can't wait for you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Oh, my God, I'm still stuck on the toilet day. Wow. All right, so <clears throat> moving on, we're going to go to Student Showcase. Yep, so okay. um, do you want to introduce Dr. Mahoney, the, uh, our student showcase? Okay, why don't we have you do it? We're very excited to have Michael Ortiz with us. Yeah. <clears throat> um, era un día normal en Puerto Rico. Todo estaba bien cuando de repente vi en las noticias que una tormenta llamada María se acercaba. La semana anterior nos dijeron que el huracán Irma nos golpearía en Puerto Rico, pero no fue así. Esto hizo que la gente pensara que María tampoco nos golpearía. Eso no viene, decía la gente. El día estaba más cerca y fue entonces cuando todos comenzaron a comprar agua, comida enlatada y botiquines de primeros auxilios. La gente comenzó a actuar de manera egoísta y a comprar cosas que no necesitaban. La gente decía, para que falte que sobre. La gente peleaba por gas y comida. Las filas eran muy largas. La gente se ponía ansiosa. En las líneas, esta cosa era más lenta, decían. <risa> Llegó el día. Todos hicieron lo que pudieron para prepararse ellos y a sus familias. Cuando llegó la tormenta, estaba en casa de mi abuela. Podíamos escuchar los árboles moviéndose, la lluvia, los vientos fuertes. Estábamos ahí escuchando todo. Era algo que algunos de nosotros nunca habíamos experimentado. Podía escuchar a mi abuela orar durante la tormenta. Los zinc en los techos de los vecinos estaban casi volando. Solo mantuvimos la calma durante ese día. Al día siguiente salimos. La pintura de la casa de mi abuela fue arrancada. Los árboles y las palmas estaban en el piso. Había inundaciones y vidrios de algunos autos rotos. No había electricidad ni agua. Tuvimos que ducharnos con galones de agua. Los alimentos en nuestros refrigeradores estaban dañados y tuvimos que botarlos. Ya mi casa, los sofás estaban mojados, los colchones... Y las ca los cajones estaban llenos de agua. Las alfombras y casi todo dentro de mi casa estaba mojado. No pudimos hacer mucho excepto botar las cosas y barrer la casa, ya que estaba todo mojado. No había señal en las radios y todo lo que se podía escuchar era el ruido de que el sonido de que no había señal. Eso solo duró unos días hasta que finalmente pudimos escuchar lo que estaba sucediendo. Todos escuchaban la radio. El gobernador decía el número de FEMA, a pesar de que no había señal telefónica. Las familias y los vecinos comenzaron a acercarse. Compartíamos hielo, comida, gas y los generadores. Las líneas para comprar el hielo eran muy largas. Se podía escuchar a los niños quejarse. Mi vecino era bombero, así que solía traernos gasolina. Por la noche, apenas se oían los grillos y las ranas, ya que estaba todo muy fuerte. Todavía no teníamos ninguna señal donde vivíamos, así que tuvimos que ir al aeropuerto para poder llamar y obtener datos. Mi padre llamó a mi tío, y mi tío le dijo que podía quedarse con él todo lo que necesitara aquí en Holyoke. Llegó la luz unos días antes de la Navidad. 
Mi papá esperó hasta que las cosas mejoraran un poco y nos dejó acomodados con mi abuela. Se fue con mi hermano durante cinco meses. Esos cinco meses fueron difíciles. Mi papá consiguió trabajo y una casa y luego de los cinco meses, el 18 de junio del 2018, viajamos mi hermano y mi madre a Hollywood. Cuando llegamos, todo era muy diferente, pero nos tocó adaptarnos. La escuela era muy diferente, las comunidades, las casas. En la escuela, mucha gente nos ayudó. La academia de los recién llegados, Miss Brunel, Miss Vasquez y Dr. Mahoney. Ha sido una experiencia diferente y le agradezco mucho a todos los que se han encargado de hacerle una experiencia única y especial. Anyone have any questions? What did he say? So many were going to wonder what he was talking about. So what he talked about was his journey here, um, how he came to Holyoke, and it was because of Hurricane Maria. So he spoke about what it was like days before it was coming. The people would be told that the storm is coming. But it's very typical that they tell you that, and the community's like, it's not coming until it does come. And so that's when there's, it's so near, people are making lines to get water, making lines to get gas, ice, just to survive. Um, he talked about how some people would buy things that they really didn't need, but in their minds it's better to have than to not have. He spoke of how he went to his gram stayed at his grandmother's house uh, during the storm and what they heard as the winds were blowing and, and the trees were, well, the palm trees um, were falling. He talked about after the storm, the flooding, and um, the glass from the autos that were in, in the flood, um, as well as when he went back to his home, how they found their house basically inundated because everything was filled with water. So their clothes that they put into um, the buckets, I forgot, totes. We call them totes, right? So they filled their clothes in there, um, their sofas, their um, a stereo system, just everything was full of water. So they had to get rid of their stuff and broom their home. A barrel, correcto? Um, they would just broom their home. Um, his father then contacted his uncle that lives here in Holyoke. And his father was the one who first traveled here and was here for five months, which was very hard on the family because the family stayed in Puerto Rico um, during that time. But his father eventually obtained a job. And um, the family then came here to be with his dad. He found a job and an apartment. So un apartamento y un, y un trabajo se encontró su papá en los cinco meses que ustedes estaban allá. And um, when they came, again, it's very different, the life here, because the homes are different, um, the community's different, the schools are different. But what helped them a lot was um, the love from the school, with the, how the school helped him, Miss Brunel, Miss Vasquez, and Dr. Mahoney. So the, the start of the, the title of, the, the story of, the, of his writing is, it was just a normal day. And so anyone who has experience living during hurricanes, like myself, um, you understand what it's like um, the days before it's coming and then not taking those precautions and then you're very close to losing what you have. And it's, it's, a severi it's very much a struggle the days after as you have no electricity and when it's family, your children, as parents, you suffer even more because you're seeing your kids that you don't have to provide. Um, so, thank you for sharing your story. Muchísimas gracias por, por um, compartir su historia. Now, does anybody have any <laughs> questions? <laughs> not, Mr. Collimore. Not a question, but we'd like to, we should really thank Betty Lichtenstein for all the work she did during that direst time of, of our country getting together. Not only our country, but the city of Hoyle getting together to help these people and really reward them. And thanks to our public schools, you know, without our public schools, all this couldn't have been arranged properly. 
And we really appreciate what Betty did to help us out. And we also have to remember that Enlace with Betty, but also at that time, Nueva Esperanza was a big presence with as well as the community of Springfield working together um, in helping um, Puerto Rico and, and the people who came plus those who were there. Any other questions? I have a question for Michael. Okay, Miss uh, Brunel. So Brunette. Yes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Close. A lot of Brunels in the house tonight. <laughs> uh, I just want to know what you're going to be doing in the future. I absolutely loved you in Caught in the Act. And <laughs> if you want to come up to the mic, I just want to know because you've had, you have such a presence and a voice and, you know, theater experience. I'm just wondering, are you going to plan on doing it in the future? I think you'd do amazing. Thank you. And, yeah, I think I'm going to be, you know, doing, I'm planning on doing <laughs> it. But, you know, you never know what life has for you. So it's, you know, whatever it takes me. So. Awesome. Oh, one moment. Mr. Sheehan? I think I missed it when Dr. Mahoney. What grade are you in now? 11. Okay. Go ahead. Michael, you, can you I? Have a, uh, I see you have a great speech and a uh, drama teacher. So uh, we both... Uh, Moved our way up through the drama department at Hoyle High School many years ago, so you're very lucky to have uh, Mrs. Brunel. Miss Mi Brunel. Michael, uh, is it? Did I did I see you perform this summer in Romeo and Juliet? What, what was your role? What's that? Romeo. That's right. That's what I thought. I was going to say I've seen this young man perform. Wow. How could I forget that you were Romeo? And I wasn't caught in the act. Yes, I have amnesia. Um, yeah. Right. Nobody remembers my performance. They remember Michael's. Um, Ms. Brunel, do you want to plug your um, the Clue performance while you're here, too? Of course I do. I'm a little shorter than this. So December 13th and 14th, we have three shows at Holyoke High School. We have a 7.30 performance on the Friday, December 13th, which is fitting for Clue on stage. And then we have a 1.30 matinee and a 7.30 show on the 14th. Tickets are on sale now. Actually, MIFA is sponsoring our online ticket sales, so people can buy tickets online now. And we have early ticket prices. Um, tickets will be going on sale later in the week at Hoyoke High School. Um, and then at the door, the ticket prices go up, so people should really jump on board and get those tickets early, which helps us get our costumes, get our sets, and all of that stuff, too, because we don't have... A budget for the show we do all of our right uh, fundraising our students do all of our fundraising and our ticket sales support our productions so please come out and support the theater company thank you real quick is there a website for the you can check us out on Facebook our page is facebook.com forward slash Holyoke theater you can get information there oh mr. Cushane yeah I just had a quick question um so what can you tell um, tell us what is it a class that you have for drama now? Is it or is it also a club or what do you have going on now? So I have multiple classes. I have an intro to theater and media literacy class, um, and then I have an advanced theater two class. So the program started last year. Uh, for the Performing and Media Arts Academy. We started with our 10th graders last year. And as the 10th graders stepped up to junior year, we added on a Theater two course, which is a more advanced class wo where those students will be devising their own productions and producing them in the spring. That will be open up to the public. So we're working kind of on our more advanced improv skills right now, a lot of kind of like sketch writing in class. Our intro course um, is more of like like, let's try out theater, let's play games, let's learn what theater is all about, let's learn the words of theater, because there's like an extensive vocabulary involved in theater. Um, so it's all that. And then that course is also mixed with the intro to media class. We do a lot of like radio advertising, writing, print advertising, writing, learning about how to be safe online, propaganda, things like that. So the kids are getting a good mix of the performing and media art side in my class. And then they can choose to take theater two with me their junior year or their senior year if they're not a performing and media arts student. Um, next year we'll be doing a capstone program for our rising juniors so this is going to be the 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 culminating project for our performing and media arts students they'll be over the course of the year working and developing a project that they'll be producing their own and then presenting that to the community in addition to that i do direct the theater company which is an after-school club 
and we do multiple performances throughout the year in the community, and this year we'll be traveling out east to compete in a statewide competition for the first time ever. So that's pretty exciting. You know, I, uh, sorry, quick, quick follow-up on that. So a long time ago, hmm? when I was in school, 1987-ish, <laughs> I'll just say, um, we had a drama club that competed regularly statewide. That was the speech tournaments, and yeah. Evan and I used to go to those, too, in I the did. 90s. Yeah. But that wasn't the METG one-act play festival competition. That was the Massachusetts Forensics League, okay. and that's still an actually operating contest, but that's not for one-act plays. That's more exp ex um, extraneous speaking, <laughs> duos, um, single performances. Yeah. It's a different organization, but we, it's do similar. Do we do anything like that anymore? Are we not involved? Not in yet. Okay. So this is the second year of performing in media arts, and I'm I'm taking on a lot every year, and this is the next big step for us, taking on this one act play festival. Yeah. Okay. But I did love speech team. Went to nationals in '98. So. All oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I did not do that. Yeah. So that's, that's All right. That's really good. Okay. Anybody else? Cool. Miss Tensley Williams. Miss Brunel. Um. Do the kids get credit on the report card for that? Is it four years? Or? They get credit for taking the courses. Once we get through the capstone planning of the project, I'm sure there's some sort of ultimate credit they'll get for performing in media arts. But right now we're in the second year of that program. And so as we step those juniors up to senior year, we'll have more firm plans on that. They can transfer those credits to college. So those aren't college level courses, but that experience in the theater program will give them a leg up on auditioning for college programs. So I do have some seniors right now that are interested in pursuing an acting career, some like Melina Garcia, who's been working with Mr. Todd for four years. She's also started working with me more recently. She wants to pursue a career in acting, and so she's gonna be working on her audition pieces with me and Mr. Todd in order for her to get scholarships and get some really great placement in college. Very good, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Oh, Mr. Shane? <coughs> because Mr. Kershane and Ms. Brunel brought it up, I will say just with the speech team and what was also the debate team we had, there's no debate team either yet, right? Not yet, it, no. They are, I mean, just so everyone knows, they're costly investments too for the district. I mean, it's, uh, there's registration fees for every tournament, I mean, buses, I mean, it's, um, and typically at least in the past speech, you were typically traveling out east, at least with debate, it was a little bit more regional at the time. I don't know if that's still the case, but I mean, there is an investment, but it, it's it's a worthwhile investment. I will say that I am probably the person I am today because of some of those yeah. um, activities and at high school. And I, I'm sure the same thing for Bevan as well. I mean, there's lots of people who really um, found a different pathway in that, and it was a different group. It, I mean, it was all different students who did it, but you didn't have to be in a class. I mean, because it was an after school thing, you could there was a lot of support after school for it. So it was it was a great opportunity for students to do something that you could do once, you could do ten times. It was you kind of made those decisions with it. But it, it's definitely something that we need back in not only Hoyle, but within our society to uh, develop people that can speak. And, and you're right, the expense is large. The buses alone are ridiculously expensive. Traveling out east, if we're traveling that far without restrooms on the bus, that's complicated. So if we're talking about a charter bus, we're talking 800 to $1,000 just for one day. And that doesn't include nurses. So when we travel with students that have medical needs, the expense for a nurse is outrageous wow. actually yeah. um so those those things add up in addition to the registration fees i mean you're talking probably 10 you could probably do 10 12 trips in a year with tournament i mean just right so we're yeah. probably talking yeah. 2500 dollars easily bare yeah. minimum if we're talking nurse and and registration and buses <laughs> mm -hmm. so luckily now we have the vans that we have through holyoke high school dean campus um, so we can start to utilize those more often that will make that more um, more accessible to us and our students. So I have a question, and maybe um, Dr. Zari can answer. I know for sports, you guys need nurses, right? Is that something that the, the school provides a, the school nurse to be a part of, or can you guys accept um, nurses who would volunteer their time? No, we, we, would, we, we would contract a nurse through the oh. district if a student uh, needed uh, a nurse because okay. they had a medical condition, then we would... Uh, we have a responsibility to provide a nurse. 
So the same would go for their trip. That's the same thing. Yeah, okay. same it's for any extracurricular okay. trip. So yeah. anytime I need yeah. a nurse, and I do have multiple students that have medical conditions that need nurses, um, we have to go through a licensed agency, um, or we have hired a per diem nurse in the past, which was more economical for our group. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Ms. Brunel. You were awesome and Kelly, and you're doing even more amazing here at Holyoke yeah. High. So we're going to go ahead and move on to communications and reports. We're going to get committee updates first. So building committee update, Mr. Sheehan. Sure. The first thing I'll say, I just got a text message. I don't know if there's something wrong with the TV broadcast, but uh -oh. people are saying it's kind of frozen. I don't know what it's frozen on. If it's, As long as it's not frozen on me. Or uh, me. <laughs> but, or me. But if we can just check the broadcast going out. Uh, um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Just a uh, building committee update as, um, I mean, the, the update is, as uh, everyone knows, we had a vote in, on November 5th. I mean, it did not pass. Um, at this point, the, the project at hand that the building committee is um, has on their docket is the two building project, which is the two middle schools. We had a meeting this past Wednesday um, that... We got some um, great public feedback at and participation at, and um, overall, we the committee still has to deal with the two project model. the The mayor, Dr. Zreich, Representative Vega, and I, uh, <coughs> and I think Councillor Sullivan and McGee are going traveling to Boston tomorrow to meet with the Mass School Building Authority. And just like last Wednesday, what I explained to people, like we really don't have many answers to any questions until. Um, after tomorrow's meeting. And we may not have many answers after that either. I mean, the MSBA, as they told us previously, was that it's a 10-day response. If you do not have a vote passage for uh, override, uh, we have until the 20th to respond. And the responses are um, limited in scope of how you're going to fund it. It's not to make changes to the overall program. So right now, th that's where we are. I mean, there's we know, we know nothing different from last Wednesday that we know today. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions? Need any clarification? I have a question. <laughs> Sorry, Devin. <laughs> Don't worry. Maybe the, the TV froze on you. <laughs> um, so I guess what the confusion is, and this is what I kind of got back at that meeting. Um, so the people that were there felt as if that, well, this is, this is going to be my assumption. They must have thought that by them coming, um, it was to give you the feedback on what, what you can do. And so they felt as if by what they said, as if it wasn't receptive because you're not going to move forward with it because they, they're not understanding that you can't. I mean, I, I could give you 20 options, but that's not part of the rules. And I, I think just to answer that, I made it very clear at the beginning of the meeting on last Wednesday that the building committee is still focused on the plan at hand, which was the two building model. And at that point, that was the, the, op the plan approved in August by the Masco Building Authority. And that's the only plan that the building committee for this two building project can take into account. So I, I did inform everyone at the beginning and at the end that we are still at the spot that this is the plan that the MSBA, that the city had submitted, that was approved, and that's where we stood. So until we um, meet tomorrow, see if we have anything out of that meeting, but the city had made a decision, the voters of the city, that they would not approve the debt exclusion, which would allow us to bond for two buildings. So that is not going to um, happen. But there's really no an there's, there are no more answers to any questions. We are still with the plan that was submitted until we say we are no longer we are unable to officially finance it. So technically, by you going tomorrow, and the reason I'm, I'm asking these these questions and these clarifying questions is because there's still a lot of confusion. So when you go tomorrow, is technically to tell them, uh, no, um, the vote was a no, and. No matter if you put the vote 
up again a month from now the same way because that's what this committee came up with. You can't, the committee cannot change what they had originally came up with, correct? Am I correct? After the Mass School Building Authority approved made it. the approval in August that the only options after a vote has occurred is to be able to say to the Mass School Building Authority how you could finance a project within the 10 days if a vote fails. One of the options is a revote. Obviously, I don't see that anywhere in Hoyoke's future, but it's if there are any other ways to finance the project. Changes to the scope of the project are not permitted by the MSBA, and that would be um, changing it to a one-story building or a whatever it may be. You, you, it's We are going more just to the meeting as a conversation. And just the last week's meeting, just so people are clear, was not – was a meeting that was scheduled in October. It was a meeting that was scheduled in response whether the vote passed or failed. It was not a meeting scheduled solely because the vote did not pass. The school building committee had to meet. Uh, we had planned it, I think Margaret and I planned it right before Columbus Day, that that day would work work best. So it was scheduled no matter what. It's We're in the 10-day window, and right now the plan is the plan that's on the table. And if the MSBA does not move forward with anything else, then the committee dissolves, correct? I mean, if we do not have the ability to finance the plan, then there's no need to have this building committee for it. And the city, if they chose to, could submit a statement of interest when it opens up in January for anything they want. I'm hoping that clarifies some stuff. Does anybody else have anything? Uh, I, I, I would just echo what, what Devin said that I know a lot of folks uh, went to the meeting last Wednesday and people are suggesting thoughts and ideas both throughout the campaign but, but post-election as well. And just given the constraints of the processes laid out for the city, um, it's not as easy as many people make it sound in terms of, well, let's do this instead. Um, and rooted in the proposal was a, a real value of equity. And so the point of the meeting tomorrow is to, yes, people have a lot of thoughts and ideas. And I think it's important for folks in the in the public to know that obviously we're going to do everything we can to, to make sure that we move forward on new facilities with the resources uh, available to us and with the, the processes available to us. And so tomorrow's meeting is is more a sort of, sort of fact-finding. Is the MSBA willing to work with us um, to some capacity, or do we need to start from square one and submit a new um, statement of, of interest, which means we would have to reappoint a new building committee and go through that process uh, again. But the, again, the point of going to the voters in the first place was, was, to, was to fund these projects. And there's implications of any other path moving forward. If we do one middle school, you know, what students go to that middle school? Do we do Peck or do we do Lawrence and the implications that, that come with that? And then if we do nothing, how do we move to a middle school model with the with the building portfolio that we have, and what does that look like? And so, you know, we've already had uh, a couple of meetings since the election uh, with Doctors Reich and his team and folks at City Hall, just trying to explore all of those options, and of course the city and the financial team, you know, trying to assess you know, the financial viability to afford, you know, even potentially one of the schools within our existing debt portfolio. But those conversations are still. Uh, ongoing, but tomorrow is important because I think we'll know by the end of the meeting, are we going to move forward um, under the two school option um, staggered over a number of years, or do we have to start this process uh, over again? We could have all the ideas in the world, but if MSBA tomorrow says this is the process, this is the law, um, and we're, you know, we haven't made an exception for other communities and we're not going to do the same for you, then we'll know that, so. Thank you. And the response that you guys get tomorrow, is that something that um, will be shared? How can it be transparent for the community to, to be aware of how the meeting went and what was the response of the MSBA? Yep. So once we scheduled that meeting that's scheduled for tomorrow, my office sent out a release as soon as we knew the meeting was scheduled, just to let the public know that myself and the state rep and Dr. Reich, uh, a couple of city councilors, uh, committee member Sheehan, had that meeting set up and the point of the meeting, and so we expect to do the same with the outcomes uh, of that meeting. You know, I'm glad we'll have a couple of counselors there as well so they can see firsthand that there are processes in place. And, you know, it's one thing to to rally and, and say you're going to demand X, Y, or Z, and then there's the actual um, facts and reality of a situation. So, you know, we can all... And, and as I said the day after the election, I mean, it's an unfortunate reality that in the richest country on earth, we were forced to divide a community like Holyoke 
point fingers at each other, accuse others of not caring about education and and whatnot, um, just because we want a new school for the first time in 30 years uh, in our city. And I think our kids, again, deserve the same access to facilities that kids in wealthy suburbs do across our state um, and across our area. And I think it's important that we continue the conversation as, as much as we can. So. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to, oh, one moment. Mr. Shand. And just remember, too, when you're talking to people, the school building committee and the MSBA worked off the educational needs and plans of the district, and that was paramount. Uh, it wasn't going into it saying we just want to build two buildings. It was what the educational needs were, and then you look at the educational needs to see what you need to do to get there, and that's the pathway that you take. It wasn't let's just build two buildings. So that the plan was to provide the best possible education for students um, with that. And Holyoke for the past 30 years has been paying for every other community to build their school buildings. Uh, across this commonwealth and haven't really gotten a bite of that carrot at all. No, and plus I've also heard comments where they didn't want so many middle schoolers under one building when we had talked about middle schools before. So I'm a little bit confused, but we'll move on next to the Joint City Council School Committee by Mr. Burks. Thank you. So in the last uh, Joint City Council School Committee meeting, we talked about absenteeism. Um, thank you, Mildred, for uh, coming to that meeting as well. Um, so um, we talked about 2013 and our, absenteeism, and our absenteeism rate being at 35%. Um, now it is at 25%, um, so it uh, dropped 6%. Um, for someone to be considered chronically absent, um, they need to miss 10% or more of the days, which is 18 days or more. So we talked about some of the reasons that um, students would be absent. So we talked about illnesses that students may have. Um, we talked about weather, um, when the weather is uh, poor conditions in the winter. Um, and we also talked about some of the neighborhoods and buildings that students live in that um, are dangerous and intimidating and some parents just choose to keep their kids home instead of sending them out or a child might choose just to stay home and not want to go to school. Um, we talked about the impact that that may have on some <coughs> children around uh, social emotional needs um, and what they might need in school and what we're going to do or what can be done to get students to school and improve the uh, attendance rate even more. So part of that discussion was home tutoring to make sure that students who were chronically absent um, were still being educated. Um, we talked about transportation and um, the walking buses. So we talked about transportation, especially in the winter months when it's uh, difficult for students to get there. And we also talked about um, what the city can do to make the neighborhoods a little bit more safe for kids to get to and from school. Um, Another thing that was brought up was adjustment counselors in schools, um, therapists to talk to those students who are struggling with uh, social emotional issues. Um, and we talked about putting together a task force uh, made up of some adjustment counselors, therapists, um, doctors, and um, things of that nature to talk about what we can further do to um, help students who may have some social emotional needs that may be keeping them um, out of school. Um, some of the things that are keeping some of the kids in school are the lunch program, free lunch program, the breakfast in the classrooms, which is good, strive for five, and things like that. So that was what the um, joint committee meeting was about that we had. Thank you. Any questions? I just had two things um, about attendance. One, uh, just when I left the office tonight, we had a team of um, – Jose Bo's team, the family engagement team, and we had teachers and paraprofessionals from across the district calling. We have about 480 families that are um, students that are chronic right now at this stage of the year at 50 days, and they were calling every one of those kids across all our schools tonight, not the high school, K to eight. Um, and we were, you know, just, just not, not as a punitive call, but as how can we help you? We notice your child's missed such and such days. Um, but we had staff from every school doing that tonight. We found that very effective last year, but we did it late. We did it in um, January last year, so we wanted to do it after the first quarter. Um, and so we'll, we're compiling that information and sending it to school principals so they know why certain kids have been out. 
for whatever reason. It could be bullying. It could be transportation. It could be uh, illness. It could be issues of um, homelessness. So we're getting that data, right, that information right now. The second thing um, I would note um, that based on the meeting we had, um, we are um, going to introduce um, some specialized winter busing this year that we have. I mean, I think Holyoke may have done it at some point, um, but we are going to run it's in the mornings. Uh, we, we're going to target Holyoke High School, Lawrence, and I forget what the third is, and Peck were the three schools that we were going to run routes um, with. We have some extra buses that aren't tiered, so it wouldn't actually incur an additional cost <coughs> um, to uh you know, Denise Rodriguez, our um, transportation director, is organizing that right now, and we hope that we hope that that will start December first and run through March. Right now, it would be just a morning uh, route, which is when we feel like is hardest for some of the kids to get to school. But from the neighborhoods, uh, you know, Bowdoin Village, um, uh, uh, South Holyoke, the Flats, um, and then all in, in and around Lawrence, where there are issues of uh, you know um, safety concerns. And families do struggle. Uh, a lot of families don't have vehicles to get their kids to school. So we're gonna we're gonna implement that this um, uh, you know this winter for the first time since I've been here. And I know, but I do know at some point the district did run busing um, uh, beyond what uh, we're legally obligated to run. Mr. Shan. Yeah, I'm just curious. Why are we not doing the attendance phone calls to Hoyokai? Uh, they're. Do you want to answer that question, Dr. Mahoney? Yeah. Since you raised your hand. Um, we have uh, we've been intensively reaching out to uh, those students who are at um, four or more absences at this point of the school year for the last two weeks, um, and we felt to do it again this week. We, we've we've initiated a Thursday school, a Saturday school, and then Monday and, and Tuesday afternoon uh, teacher support opportunities for kids to buy back attendances and to get their houses back in order, so to speak. Um, we are going to do a, a phone banking the week we come back. Uh, from Thanksgiving. We want to give a week to see how things look um, with the uh, outreach that we did last week with phone calls and letters um, as well as um, kids who are in danger of, of exceeding absences um, got a note uh, with their first quarter grades saying you're in danger of not receiving credit uh, until you make until you buy back these absences. So we, we figured that um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the value added would be greater when we return from the Thanksgiving break than if we were to do it right now. Any other questions? Not for you, Mr. Mahoney, thank you. All right. All right, we're gonna go ahead and Let's move. Okay, we're gonna yep. go to see mental health services for elementary schools. Yep, so Sarah uh, Rigney, I'd love to call you up here. Um, I'm, I'm just going to give a brief uh, introduction. Um, I'm just going to start by saying, like, this is, um, uh, since over the last, well, year and a half to two years, I've gotten a lot of feedback about the need um, to provide additional mental health supports for elementary school students, predominantly pre-K to four, but really kindergarten to fourth grade across the district. And we've seen the needs um, and this, you know, this is a, something I, um, there are tre these trends exist, I think, across the state. We see more and more young students who are struggling with significant mental health uh, needs. And as a system, while we've created alternative paths um, at the high school level with Opportunity Academy, and we started a middle school alternative model, a success academy, um, we have not been successful as a school district in providing enough mental health supports for our youngest learners. And when I ask around to um, other districts, other urban districts in Massachusetts, and I've asked superintendents, what do you do? What models do you have? Their response is, I don't know. If you've got something, let me know. And so um, we, you know, I think we're on the front end of, some, um, of um, uh, you know, a number of students that come to us with trauma. And to, our schools do, I think, the best they can, but I don't think they do a particularly strong job of um, providing supports within the school. Our, the only game in town for students that are struggling is special education um, or sending a student out of district or to a different school or more restrictive um, uh, placement. And which is unfortunate because we haven't, uh, we don't have the services in the school, right, to, um, to exhaust all options before we make a decision about what that child 
needs. And that's particularly concerning when you're talking about very young learners who are still developing, like a six-year-old, a seven-year-old is still developing, um, you know, and, and uh, to make decisions about their education at that age, I think can be very detrimental for, for them. And so um, in the last, uh, and I had a conversation, I don't know if you remember Mr. Burks, we talked in the spring of last year, and uh, I had a long conversation outside of JP's with Mr. Burks about, you know, having developing um, services, not programs, but services within our schools at each school that could better support our um, students who, who struggle with acute mental health needs. And um, I got a lot of feedback from principals and teachers already in the start of this school year. And with the additional funding that we received from the state, um, which we didn't, we got over the summer into the fall, uh, we decided, and I talked to Mr. Soto, that we, we would allocate that funding to a new service model for, um, to support students who are struggling with significant uh, mental health challenges in our school. And what we, what are, and I'm gonna let our partners, we, we're partnering with the Brookline Center for Community Mental Health, who does a tremendous amount of work across the, um, the state. Um, but, and they, they're, they are working at uh, Peck, and they are working at Holyoke High. But the model that we are introducing is unique. It's an elementary school uh, model. Um, the, the, and I want to just talk about the model before I turn it over to our partner, uh, Sarah Rigney. Um, we are targeting uh, supporting four schools um, in this model, which would be Kelly, Lawrence, Morgan, and Sullivan. And the reason we chose those four schools is we saw the greatest uh, you know, we, we have data on discipline rates and uh, issues around um, the number of kids who are, see, you know, uh, seeing mental health support, the number of referrals that we're getting. Uh, the focus would be on grades K to 4. Each school would be provided with a dedicated clinician that would be a Holyoke Public School employee and an instructional paraprofessional that would be a Holyoke Public School employee. Um, and the Brookline Center for Mental Health would provide the support, the coaching, the professional learning, um, and would provide o oversight and support for these folks um, working with students. They would be, students would be referred with parental permission, parental um, support, and we wouldn't, we would assign a small number. The caseloads would be a manageable caseload um, where the student would spend, you know, hopefully some, some time um, in their classroom uh, and that would would shift, and then sometime with the clinician and the instructional paraprofessional, depending on the, would, they, what they needed. It would be fluid, right? But you'd have to be referred, and there'd be a process to be referred. Um, and so the child could spend, at least initially, as more time outside of their room in a separate space getting their instruction um, delivered by the paraprofessional, assigned by the classroom teacher, with the goal of getting the child back into the general education program. And this would be for students who are special needs already or who do not have special needs but are struggling with a you know, um, some sort of trauma. Now, I do, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions. I'm gonna let, I want Sarah, I, I can tell already on the left, my left, like I might get attacked here in two seconds. <laughs> but, um, but I do wanna just say too, I wanna let Sarah do her presentation. But I also wanna point out, like this is a pilot, like this is a model we're trying. We okay. There isn't a blueprint for this. Haven't seen it um, in a lot of schools across the state. Um, I do think it's an important step forward. But we're going to learn a lot, and we hope that this can be a a model for the types of services that all our elementary schools could benefit. The resources al allow us right now to start with four schools. Plus, we don't have the bandwidth to support this across all um, eight or nine elementary and middle schools. Is the green button on? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Um, I just wanted to expand a little bit on Dr. Zreich, um, his uh, characterization of, of the program that I work for. Um, so specifically, we're talking about a tier three intervention. I don't know how many folks are familiar with the MTSS model, multi-tiered systems of support. Um, so the idea is that our students who are at Tier 3 are students with the greatest needs. Um, and so um, this program would specifically be working to support those Tier 3 students to be successful in both returning to the classroom but also maintaining overtime in the classroom. Um, 
we'll get into this a little bit more, but I think uh, something I just want to put out there for folks to think about even before I get into some of the details is that this is a multifaceted program that relies on direct clinical and coping supports in the in the school, um, as well as collaboration and coaching with teachers in the school, and then most, almost more importantly, uh, coordination of care with services and providers outside of the school and with the family. Kind of a funky clicker. There you there. go. Okay. Okay, so a little bit about the Bright program. It's been in existence for about 15 years. It started at Brookline High. Um, and as you can see um, from this PowerPoint uh, slide, we have grown tremendously in the last um, 15 years that we've actually been in service. Um, we are now up to about 140 schools. Uh, about 137 of those are just in Massachusetts, but we've got some in Western New York, Connecticut, and we're talking to some programs out in uh, Oregon and Washington as well. In terms of uh, urban and gateway communities, uh, as you can see from this list, we're also working with several around the state, including Boston. Uh, later this week, I'll be going to Framingham to have conversations with them about starting up an elementary program there. Um, Lynn, Malden, Marlboro, uh, and several others around the state. So some context for Bright. <clears throat> I think what we're finding, and, and certainly my anecdotal experience of the last 10 years, uh, which was as an outpatient provider down in Springfield, working with schools both in and around Springfield, is that uh, schools are really becoming the de facto safety net <laughs> for students who are um, presenting with major mental health issues. And part of this is about you know um, where systems fail to meet one another. So where we're seeing hospitals discharging students um, after insurance stops paying for them to be in an inpatient or a partial program. Um, we're also seeing where DCF kind of hands off. And so where do kids go when those systems um, can't meet them? They end up back in school. And so um, they're either presenting with their symptoms here in school or you're dealing with them in various places, whether it's the nurse's office, the adjustment counselor's office, or the principal's office. Um, so in our conversations with Steve in the last couple of weeks, um, what he brought to us is that there are a small but really significant number of students who are struggling at the elementary level. Um, and as is really typical when a, when a kid arrives at tier three, um, the amount of energy and support required to help them be successful is disproportionate to the actual number of students, right? And so we want to support both the kids in being successful in school, and we also want to support the adults who are helping them to feel successful in school. Um, and to that end, we had proposed uh, implementing the Bright Program. So a little bit about the Bright Program um, and what we're proposing versus traditional school approaches. And just uh, a word on this slide. Um, The left side of the slide, which looks at traditional school-based approaches, um, was done with the help of the director of Bright, who um, spent a lot of time um, in a public school setting. And um, he and I have been working really closely together, both in the school and local schools. Um, and it's been a really interesting dynamic, because I come from such a clinical mindset. Um, and he comes from you know many, many years of having been an educator. And what we've kind of boiled this down to is his own experience of thinking, well, behavior is behavior, and sometimes kids are willful, and yet, you know you have to have consequences for those behaviors and uh, respond accordingly. Um, and when you're having an empathic approach, it's one that's more like intuition based as opposed to, say, like evidence based. Um, and he often described, especially, with the implementation of SEL directives, that sometimes there were just too many gaps in those services, and so you still ended up with discipline as the response to kids who are really struggling in school settings. And so um, my work in schools and my work with Bright is really working with schools and teachers to look beyond behavior to say, why do students act this way? And to, to look at it both from the mental health perspective, but also from a clinically informed culturally responsive framework. 
So what does that mean? It means that we're understanding children through a cultural and historical lens while also maintaining hope and promise for their future. It means setting excellent, setting excellent uh, relationships with students, helping to set out an appropriate frame and contain them, um, and actually working to de-escalate them with regularity. So what Dr. Zreich was talking about is really working with kids at the elementary level to de-escalate, re-regulate in order to go back into the classroom and be able to learn, because kids who are dysregulated can't actually learn. So a little bit more on the trauma-informed piece. Um, some of you may be really familiar with like kind of the standard definition of trauma, which is up on the, on the screen here, which is someone experiencing a serious injury to oneself or witnessing a serious injury to or death of someone else, facing imminent threats of serious injury or death to, one, death to oneself or others, or experiencing a violation of personal physical integrity. We can define trauma in a lot of different ways. I think people are really familiar with um, trauma as it's defined in, say, a domestic violence scenario, sexual abuse, physical abuse. Um, but I'd like to add, uh, to build that out a little bit more, to understand trauma as in a larger uh, framework of traumatic stress, which is when a person is completely overwhelmed with their experience um, and therefore unable to cope with what's happening to them. So to the lens of trauma, what I would add is historical trauma and racial trauma. So what are those things? So historical trauma is a form of trauma that impacts entire communities. It can be based on race. It can be based on ethnicity. It can be based on class. But the idea is that that is trauma that is passed down from one generation to the next in terms of how parents teach their children to be safe in a community or to protect themselves in a community. Um, when we talk about racial trauma, we're also talking about the stressful, the stress impact and the emotional impact of experiencing daily racial discrimination um, and the impact that has not only on how people live their day-to-day -day lives, but how that impacts their nervous system on a physiological level, which can cause dysregulation. So why is this really critical for us to understand? On a physiological level, trauma has, in a word, it tends to hijack our brain, literally, right? So our left brain, which is where all our logic resides, okay, gets taken over by our right brain and by parts of our brain that are designed to protect us from threat, okay? And a kid who is existing in a state of survival or hypervigilance is not able to access their rational brain, which is where all the logic, all the thinking, all the planning, all the executive functioning, all of, all of those things which are necessary for academic learning happen. So in order to help our kids learn, we need to have that trauma-informed lens, taking into account various types of trauma and also just the experience of existing in what could be uh, a day-to-day -day experience that feels really fraught with threat. So I think one of the ways that we tend to see trauma is we can think about the kid who's really dysregulated, acting out, causing fights, flipping desks, being really um, um, engaging in a lot of externalizing behaviors. But what we also see um, aside from, from that is difficulty in peer and adult relationships, um, really provocative behavior, difficulty concentrating, poor memory retention being really disengaged, showing up with a lot of physical symptoms or somatic symptoms, um, avoiding work, appearing disinterested or not caring about their schoolwork, having really poor self-concept, being tired, um, or just not being able to participate or function very well in school. So Bright is committed to, um, to equity and designing um, from the margins inward. So you'll see a picture of a curb cut. Um, curb cuts make it easier for everybody to use a sidewalk, right? Um, you don't have to use a curb cut, but it certainly does make it easier when you just don't have to take a step up. So the idea is that if we build it for, you know, if we build a program for our students who most need it, we actually really serve everyone in doing so. And so to that end, 
just a quick overview of the Bright model. There's four components to it, students, space, services, and staffing. And so um, students are those tier three students. Uh, we look to identify a space within the school that is contained, secure, feels safe. We decorate it appropriately as a way to invite students to participate and be able to calm down. And that includes both some space to do work, but also a place to you know, use skills or toys or um, therapeutic tools to be able to relax and calm down um, and really engage in the process of learning how to manage their behaviors and their emotions in a way that permits them to go back to class. And then we talk about staffing. Dr. Zarek already mentioned this, but just to reiterate, um, we're, we were talking about having an academic paraprofessional as well as a clinician be in the room to support all, any or all students that are in the space and needing uh, support to return to class successfully. So in terms of services, these are the four primary services. Again, we have the academic support and the clinical support being offered uh, in the school um, to students in the moments that they need it. And then most importantly, we also have family engagement, which involves getting the parent on board, providing external and internal resources to the parents in order to have any additional family needs met, and then care coordination to align uh, the school and the family around the, the student's care. So for our rollout, we're talking about four schools. Uh, again, Kelly, Lawrence, Morgan, and Sullivan. We're going to focus on pre-K through fourth grade. Um, we will have dedicated uh, professionals in, both si in all sites. Um, the programs are going to build gradually. Um, we're going to integrate hopefully one student at a time so that we can you know, um, really learn how best to serve our students in those spaces. And then we're going to customize each, um, each classroom to each school based on the school's culture, um, the culture of the families who attend that school, their needs, um, and we'll roll out accordingly. So part of what that process is going to look like is sitting down with each of the schools and, and determining um, what assets they already have in place so we can figure out where does Bright fit and where can we help fill in some gaps. Uh, we already have some great data collection from all of the schools in terms of what's the ideal population that we're serving. Um, and we have a starter pack, quote unquote, of documents that we hand out to every school. These are pre-made. You can already, you can insert all your logos. So there's no additional work for the schools to do in terms of creating referral forms, intake forms, uh, information sheets for parents um, that are both in Spanish and English as well as any other languages that they need to be. Um, all of that is already ready to go. Um, and as soon as we have students to enroll, we'll be able to get schools up and running with those um, documents. Additionally, uh, once the programs are in place, part of my job is to provide te technical assistance to all of those classrooms in the form of problem solving individual st student issues, helping to create documents or other necessary frameworks, um, discussing you know, trainings both at the, the teacher level, um, the administration level, to promote the idea of how do we continue with a, a culturally responsive, trauma-informed, clinically-informed um, program that best meets the needs of all of our students. Um, additionally, we have a portal where we have FERPA and HIPAA-related, um, uh, FERPA and HIPAA-protected um, data collection that uh, at the end of the school year, schools are able to turn into data that lets us plan for the following year. We also have documents compiled by all of the schools in our network to help students, uh, to help schools run the most effective program possible. Um, and we hold uh, special uh, professional developments over the course of the year that are free for all uh, Bright staff to attend, uh, in addition to our annual symposium, which happens once a year every fall. So um, ideally, uh, we're actually in the midst of program planning right now. Um, I have three or four meetings scheduled for next week to meet with um, those elementary schools uh, and expect to have the fourth lined up soon. Um, we also need to hire clinicians um, and identify paraprofessionals uh, for the spaces and then set the spaces up themselves. 
uh, in December and January, our hope is to begin initial implementation once the rooms are staffed um, with intensive support from me, which will look like uh, being present at least once a week um, to our contract, our contracted clinician who's going to help oversee these schools. Um, and as much on the ground support as needed for admin and teaching staff. January through, January through June will be continued implementation, shared learning across the schools uh, via community practice sessions, one-on-one um, -on -one support, phone calls, um, you know, program development, uh, intervention development, um, et cetera. And then uh, in May, June of this year, we'll reflect and hopefully plan for next year and, and ideally um, see what we've done really well and continue to build on that uh, for the coming year in more schools. So can I just, uh, before, just before we turn over, I mean, this builds on the conversation we also had, and I forgot to mention, at our retreat in, uh, when we met in February, was that February, we had our retreat, we talked about tiers of support. This is the tier three supports that we are um, desperately lacking or significantly lacking at many of our schools. Um, these jobs are posted already. They are, and we're moving, we want to move quickly so that we can begin um, this model by, um, no later than January 1st, but hopefully by December 1st in some of the in some of the schools. Um, and then we have a whole half of a year to ramp up so we can see if this is a model that we continue to um, build on for additional schools as we hopefully see more um, resources coming to districts like ours come next, next uh, or coming through the budget process this year. Great. Ms. Tensley Williams. I just have a quick question for you, Dr. Z. Um, how do you plan on buying back the absenteeism? How do the <clears throat> Oh, so you had a question for the previous. Right. I'm no. so sorry. It's I thought... okay. It's all right. Oh, okay. To buy back uh, absenteeism. So how... To buy back absenteeism, students have to come um, and do a minimum of half a school day um, and have a, an academic program for half of the day. They can buy back a day, but it has to be the – um, a ha at least three and a half hours, which is half of our school day. That's any day they pick? <clears throat> well, no, they have to pick a day where the school's offering okay. additional programming. It could okay. be a vacation. It could be Saturday. Dr. Mahoney has uh, Thursday afternoons, Saturdays, um, and then we, we're going to use the vacation periods as well. Thank you. To okay, do that. that's good. Yep. <clears throat> Mr. Sheehan. I thought, I thought you told me. No, I don't have a question. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Burks. Just on professional development. Uh, as you said, the Bright staff uh, does continuous professional development. Does that extend to the rest of the staff in the district, or at least the ones who are piloting this program? Like, will all teachers receive a training? Will all paraprofessionals receive some sort of training on what Bright is about and how they can better service students when it comes to recommending them? Part of the a part of the plan in working with Bright is that um, we work with the school district as a whole to figure out who else needs to be trained. Not necessarily in the model. We we do do a really planned rollout in terms of educating um, s faculty and admin around what Bright is, how kids can get referred for it, how it serves them, um, so that everybody is really well educated around what the p program itself is. In terms of other professional development, in terms you know say, working with students who have, you know, complex trauma and how that might present in your classroom and how best to support them. You know, for kids who are in the Bright program specifically, part of the work that would happen between the staff in the room and the teachers of those students is to work one-on-one -on -one with the teacher around what does this particular student need and what is that about, without going to the specific details of, you know, that kid's particular trauma or background. Wider trainings would also be available, and that would be something that I would work with the district on in terms of setting those up, and would also be, you know, happy to help implement those or facilitate those. <coughs> Mr. Collimore. Yeah, uh, you talked about space for these students. Uh, is there any plans down the road for specific space <coughs> within the school? Where these students would be going? I think I'm going to, I would probably turn that back to Dr. Jack. Yeah, we, we want to, I mean, some schools are space um, constrained, so they may not have um, 
the the uh, the the space, but we think we can find. Um, we're hopeful at least in three of the four schools that there is an extra space and it's not meant to be a punitive space. It's meant to be more of a therapeutic sensory space that students can use as their checkout, check-in um, space at the school. Um, so at least in three of the four schools, it's less, uh, there, there is that space and that's why they're meeting with each school to figure out what space they can allocate for this um, this model. Um, of course, like like as you know, we are tight in some of the buildings, so it might be a little trickier. But the idea is that there is a dedicated space in every school. Okay. Anyone else, Miss Feliciano Sims? Oh, thank you. Um, can you just one like tell me um, what does the referral process look like when a uh, teacher is going to refer a student? Or are you working with the counselors with who have passed? with some of our students and then also the last statement you said about not sharing enough information to the teachers like um wouldn't that be like an important role like so the teacher can actually service the child better i mean like if we know like the child is suffering at home because of homelessness or or whatever right like wouldn't that be a big piece for the teacher to know? so let me start with that one okay question. yeah because yeah. maybe i got that confused I was no like, that's okay did I miss something? um so I think something to keep in mind is that the population of students we serve may be kids who are also coming off hospitalizations or have mental health issues. It's um, We want to protect a student's confidentiality because not everybody needs to know a kid's diagnosis or what that diagnosis is specifically about. Um, but it is really important to understand like what triggers the student. How does this, you know, what symptoms are they presenting with and what is that about? Because I think we want to provide enough context without, um, without, uh, you know, breaking a student's confidentiality and that's a, that's a fine balance. So, you know, I think the clinician in the classroom working with the student would be working within HIPAA and FERPA guidelines um, and just keeping in mind what's enough information so that everybody can be on the same page in supporting the student without disclosing, say, like the very specific and personal nature of a particular trauma that's happened. That's what I mean. Okay. I, 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 I hear you. I just kind of disagree with it, right? So, like, for me personally, <laughs> um, I work in the Department of Developmental Services, right? We serve as students and, uh, with special needs and stuff like that. And for me, not to know the diagnosis to create some community inclusion, right? Like, not to know, like, what triggers them, right? So if I have a... Um, an individual who was sexually assaulted, I'm not going to put her in an all-male facility, right? Mm -hmm. If I know she suffers some time of PTSD, I just, I don't know. That's w weird. I think that's maybe the first time. Because, again, a teacher's there to service, right? And a teacher's there to provide the support. So the teacher's limited in the knowledge. And I get it. I think maybe, I, and we can go on this later I think on, we, right? I think we're actually agreeing. Okay. I think there are some instances where sharing a student's diagnosis would be appropriate. Right. Um, I think the particular details of... A trauma because you're working with a student so having been a clinician and having been a clinician in a school where I've worked really closely with school folks um, teachers adjustment counselors principals um, part of what I'm using as my guide is I'm sitting with the student saying I really think there are people in the school who can help and support you let's talk about what information I can share with them that you would be comfortable with but it's also going to be about helping you you know, do better in school and stay in school and go to your classes. Okay. So in that sense, I'd be working really closely with the student because they need to feel safe, but their safety is also contingent upon having some degree of control over, like, the information that's shared. That's not necessarily different for elementary schoolers. Their parents may be making the decision because developmentally it's not appropriate for them to do it, but... We want to be working with the families to have a shared understanding of what's happening. And some of that means giving them some control over, like, how much a teacher does know or doesn't know. Um, but I think it's fair to say, like, if I ever had a student who had a trauma history and that's part of what was showing up in class, I can go to a teacher and say, listen, trauma is at play here. Let's be considerate of that without going into the specifics of, like, here are all the five traumas that this kid has experienced because the teacher doesn't necessarily need to know that. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, you asked a, a couple of questions before oh, that man. that I can't remember. I just got into so that one. Um, okay. It was the referral process. What does yes. that look like, right? Because, okay. again, we somebody can be like, oh, I flipped a chair, and now I'm going to be labeled as trauma, right? No. So, okay. Right. And, well, and I want to be really clear that, you know, we're talking about having a trauma-informed lens. And another way of saying that is, like, how do we also have a – 
engage in, um, have healing centered engagement. So it's not that every kid who has a behavioral issue has trauma, but I think when a kid shows up with a major behavioral issue, we want to ask the question, hmm, is trauma at play here? Um, because I think historically there's been a tendency to look at kids and their behavior and think of it as really willful when it hasn't been. You know, sometimes kids are engaging behavior because they literally don't have control over their bodies, and that is coming from a, that is coming from a place of their, their bodies responding to trauma. Right, their bodies are activated and their bodies are responding in a way that they don't actually have a ton of control over. So one doesn't necessarily mean the other, but I think asking ourselves the question every time to, to, to wonder is really important. That being said, um, so Bright typically serves um, three major groups of kids. The first and primary group is actually kids who are coming off of a mental health hospitalization. So they've missed a lot of school because they've been hospitalized, they've been in partial hospitalization, they've been in CBAT, um, and they've missed anywhere from five to 10 school days, which is a lot of school to miss. Um, and so the job of Bright is to support those kids in reintegrating back into the classroom successfully without going from, I've just had had a major health, major mental health crisis to, hey, it's business as usual and we're back in school and I'm in school seven hours a day and I've got two weeks of school work to make up. Um, so the second group of kids are kids with um, chronic absenteeism, maybe not five days in a row, but like, you know, once a week, a couple times a week, and or kids who are showing up and physically present in school, but not actually like engaged in class um, not participating in class, not completing work. Um, so they're wanting to be there, but they're not actually able to function well in school. Um, and historically, those are all the students that we served. So for a kid who's coming in from an inpatient hospitalization or CBAT or something like that, or even a medical hospitalization, it's a pretty much a straight referral. The school generally knows that the student has been out for those reasons. They can let the Bright team know that they've got it, you know, when the discharge is coming and the kid basically go straight to Bright. I think for kids who are, you know, our students who show up in the nurse's office really frequently or spend a lot of time in guidance or in, you know, central office with the principal, those are kids who uh, a, lot of, a lot of times have gone through, like, the student support team or child study teams that various districts have um, where they're looking at high acuity cases of kids who are either um, have really acute behaviors and or um, are not performing well. Um, not showing up to class, missing a lot. Um, and those students usually end up in the SST meetings anyway. And those are kids who we would consider for Bright as well. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Mr. Cushane? Um So how, how is this um, funded exactly? Like how does, how, does the, how does the program come into our district? Like what? Um, so we're, um, we're paying for the... Um, the counselors and the paraprofessionals um, out of additional funding that we received that we had set aside. And then we're contracting with Brookline um, uh, Center for Mental Health to provide consultation support and professional training for the folks that are will be our employees. Um, the, one of the questions Mildred had asked me here is, are we, are we billing health insurance? We're not bill billing health insurance. That was a, important for us. We didn't want to get involved in like that process, we wanted any child who needed the support in the school to be able to get it without having to worry about uh, billable hours, billable hours, and so forth. So it looks like eight professionals to start with. Like yes, yeah, some some of the paraprofessionals we already have. We have ex some excess paraprofessionals. So we posted for two paraprofessionals and four cl uh, clinicians, and then we have a contract uh, with um, with Brookline um, to support their um, to offer consultation because we don't have the band we didn't feel like we had enough internal capacity to really help these folks get this program off the or these services off the ground when it has i hesitate calling it a program it's a set of services okay and it's it looks like it said something about one student at a time and then two like a maximum of yeah how uh, many students we said about um six to eight students maximum but we would build you know we don't want to you know inundate the per people right away but the maximum would be you know, six to eight students also depends on the mix of students at every school. When we ask schools across the district, I asked principals just to give me a, a just a sense of like how many students they felt were really, you know, had this acute level of need. 
the, it was less than 3% um, of our, our students. It was about 80 students um, across the multiple. That, that's all schools, um, K to 4, that they felt most, you know, had the qualities of being tier 3 students. I think even that's high, but, um, but we have, you know, so um, most schools have between 5 to 10 kids that take up a tremendous amount of time. Um, and uh, as Sarah mentioned, um, you know, require more support than what our schools are able to provide them right now. I have a question. Ms. Ms. Brunette. Uh, so I was wondering, is there going to be some sort of professional development with teachers about uh, the Brookline Center and what they're doing? Um, yeah. Yes. I know that in yeah. my experience, uh, as my dad being a uh, testament right. counselor in Lincoln Elementary, one of the biggest parts is a stigmatization for services like these within teachers and therefore thinking that the referral is somehow they can get away from them. So my question is stigmatization of this program. Is yeah. there going to be a professional development to yeah, bust it out the gate? You ask a really good question. I can tell that you, uh, <laughs> you're related to somebody that does this work. Um, <laughs> and, um, but yeah, what's it? Well, no, she just said, I know her father, I know her father. Um, but, um, but I would say, um, yes, I mean, I think part of it is we would like to develop the capacity of the, these folks in the schools to be mm -hmm. experts within the school. That's why we want them to be Holyoke Public School employees and staff at these schools who can, um, t who can develop this, um, you know, the, the mindset with amongst the staff in the school. We really think the principals have to buy in mm -hmm. and understand, and that's why the meetings uh, are, the initial meetings have been with the school leaders so that they fully understand what this is and what this isn't. This isn't just, you know, we f free for all, every student that they have concerns with ends up in these services. Um, we also, I, I haven't shared this, but we, as many of you know, we've been looking for a social emotional learning director for almost two years now, and we just hired somebody who will begin in the next month. Um, and the idea is that um, in this person's new role, um, they will oversee all behavioral and mental health services in the district so that it's also owned by the school district as well, not just, um, you know, this uh, Brookline, their Brookline Mental Health Center is a partner of ours, but we have to own this as a school system, and this has to be part of the training and the support, part of our model for tiered supports across the um, the schools, and everybody understands what exactly this is and what it isn't. So we want to be careful, like, this isn't just, like, their thing, Brookline's thing. Yeah. This is Holyoke Public Schools. Got it. Uh, work. Do you have another question? No, nope, that's it. Yeah. Thank you, though. Anybody else have any questions, Mr. Uh, Colomer? Just, Doctor, just the funding. Mm -hmm. uh, is all this funding coming from the state, or? Yeah, so we, we received uh, over a million dollars extra f funding that we hadn't anticipated. Um, some of it funded um, uh, extra staff that we needed at the over the summer. Um, it funded, um, you know, we had uh, class size issues. We added more special education and ELL teachers, but we also held a, 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 um, a funding aside um, for us to be able to do something like this. We didn't know exactly what we were going to do, um, and um, people were asking us, how are you going to use some of the additional funding you got from the state? This seemed, um, you know, Anthony will tell you we don't have the funding, but um, I'm telling you that we, uh, we knew we had additional funding that we could allocate, and we just felt like this was the right... Um, and this was some of the ch shifts that were made in the Chapter 70 formula for this year, and we anticipate that to continue, if all goes well at Be on Beacon Hill, that we'll continue to see additional funding. And this, in my opinion, was some of the areas our schools have been lacking and didn't have enough resources for. I've heard it from many of you at this, in this room over the years. Any other questions? Oh, my turn. <laughs> I'm going to behave. <laughs> so a few things, few questions. Um, first, because you did mention something very interesting, and um, it's partial, the CBAT, and inpatient. I know an inpatient, within how many days after does um, schooling start, your two-hour little classes? It starts, what, like three days after their inpatient, that they start receiving two hours a day of schooling? So I think... I want to be really clear. So 
bite only comes into play when the student is discharged from inpatient and comes back to school. No, I understand that, okay. but you are aware of inpatient psych, correct? Yes. Okay. So an in inpatient psych, because I'm going to talk about absenteeism. Yep. With partial and CBAT, an inpatient, do we con do they continue to be on the Holyoke Public Schools um, role of absence when in reality, I believe for partial, the Holyoke Public Schools has to provide um, the material that the student is supposed to be working on and learning. So would that still be considered an absence? I'd have to answer that question. I believe that by the definition of chronic absenteeism, that is still, con they're considered absent from school. Even if they're receiving the, yes. your two hours of education? I so believe all the answer get. to that is yes. I can double check okay. um, how we code those students now, but I, my, yeah, my guess is that they are, in fact, absent. Okay. You talk a lot about Bright Program and being a bright kid. Um, you know, when they come back, they're part of Bright Program. I just don't want this to go into what we have, the tip kid and the bright kid. Um, so I want to make sure that with this program, it's about providing the supports and bringing the supports that are needed so that the child can, can succeed and can access the curriculum within either general classroom or in sub-separate classrooms, or both, um, versus separate school, right? Could, and if I could speak to that really quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, in our more extended version of, of being able to present Bright, um, part of what we talk about is actually that our goal is to have uh, students back into s at least some of their classes within a couple of days, right? So a, a student who is, say, discharged from an inpatient program Let's say discharge happens on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, they might come to the school on Wednesday to with their with their parent or guardian to meet with with the clinical coordinator and the academic coordinator, the adjustment counselor if that's pertinent. Any other any other parties that know the student, know the family, who who can and want to be involved in kind of supporting their reintegration back into school, and we do what's called a reentry meeting, which is really a meeting to meet with the family and say. What do you need and how can we be there to support you in this process? Here are the things that we have in place. Let's talk about what else we might need to put in place. The goal is to really connect with the family in that meeting and to make answer all their questions and make them feel held um, and to lay out a tentative plan for that student's reintegration back into the school setting. Now, for a kid who's been out for an absence, some of the anxiety is around, I've missed all this work, how am I possibly gonna make it up? People are going to wonder why I wasn't here. What do I tell them? And so they come back, and they might start school again on Thursday after having the reentry meeting on Wednesday. And they might spend Thursday and Friday just in the bright classroom going over the school work that they've missed and talking about like what strategies they need to um, – and just getting to know the staff um, in those couple of days, with the goal being that on Monday of the next week they might go back to some of their classes to start with. Um, Bright at the elementary level is also going to look a lot like uh, in the moment de-escalation and using, you know, when a child is having problems, really beginning to look like, uh, to understand for each child, what does it look like when they start to escalate? How do we intervene earlier? How do we give them the tools that work for them to de-escalate and then be able to go back to class and maintain? So it really is, there is an, a really nice ebb and flow for students to move back and forth in between their classrooms where we all want them to be and where they want to be, and then also go to the bright classroom when and they need um, a space to kind of be able to get control of their bodies again. Okay, great. Um, I'm happy that you did make a comment that not all kids are, are trauma um, because genetics does play a big part. And a lot, a lot of it could also be based on genetics because it's fair to say that if uh, a parent is um, diagnosed with a mental health disorder, and they're taking medications for it, their offspring has a higher chance of becoming diagnosed. Yes. Um, 
yes, that is true. I think it's it's not actually to the rates that most people believe they are, but um, but there are also so many other factors when you take into account a parent who made who maybe has like major mental health issues in terms of. Um, the ways in which that can have ripple effects on other aspects of the child's environment um, that then impact the child. And the reason why I said that is because, as Ms. Feliciano Sims had mentioned in regards to training and staff, I understand where you're trying to go with the HIPAA and um, what people should know and the limitations on it. But with HIPAA, it's on an as, not an as needed, it's, um, a need to know basis based on the person that's going to be working with the child or with the individual. So in that sense, I think that all staff should be trained. And it's, this is what staff is asking for in reality. Um, we've been throwing out the word social emotional learning, but I don't think anybody really understands what that looks like, nor what it is. It's just, it's a fab word. Like every convention you go to, it's we are going to implement social emotional learning. But what is it? What is so different about it? Is it a book that you're adding to this thing? Is it um, a toy? Is it a specific class? What does social emotional learning look like? The same would go for the Bright program. What is it that you're bringing <laughs> to the school and to the staff, if you are going to be providing the work and knowing the whole child as a whole, but the teacher or whoever direct staff, even non-direct staff, because there's still other staff that's making connections with the students. So you have your custodial, you have your um, cafeteria dietary, um, you have the people who work in the office, uh, um, the administrative assistants. They're also making connections, but yet again, we're going to the fact of it's we're only going to provide the teacher with, with, let's just say, the trigger, right? <coughs> would we, and I asked doctors like this, would we tell a teacher if a child has a diagnosis of a seizure disorder? His comment was yes. Why wouldn't we tell them if they are on a direct care, they're actually having direct connection with the student it, with the parent's permission, because even with a seizure disorder, the parent has to give permission as well, any medical. So with the parent's permission, why would we not share the fact that maybe this child has post-traumatic stress disorder and you might see the escalation during springtime? Because at that point, it's what do we put into place before spring comes into play where we can help this child through that roller coaster ride that they're going to experience and provide them the supports as well as the family supports? If I may, yeah, um, I completely agree with you. I'm, I think there may, have, there may have been a misunderstanding when the original question was asked. I'm simply differentiating between sharing a kid's diagnosis versus getting to the specifics of what the trauma was, okay. right? So like if a child has an anniversary every spring because of something traumatic that happened, it is important for us to know. It's important for us to know the timing. It's important for us to be prepared around that. It's important for us to know that it's actually a trauma. Um, but I don't think, you know, the specifics of this is when this child was <laughs> beaten really badly by the grandparent who is staying in the house with them. I'm not sure we need to go into that level of detail for teachers to get the understand to understand that like a significant trauma happened for the child, you know, spring two years ago, um, and that's where that's where I'm just making a, you know it's a fine distinction. Um, it is important for people to know what diagnoses are and how they manifest in the school setting. I actually think that's really critical to destigmatizing mental health. Mm -hmm. I think it's really critical for people to understand that. Kids aren't being willful, <laughs> that their behavior isn't just because they're having a rough day or they're in a bad mood, um, but that um, they are really responding um, physiologically to an external stressor that, but that is triggering an internal, you know, an internal response to a previous trauma and or to, you know, um, 
or that maybe just be part of their genetic makeup if they're a kid who has chronic major depressive disorder. Um, so, you know, one thing I'm really proud to say is that I think, you know, I have been a Bright team member for only a few months, but I've already been really impressed by how well some of these programs connect, not just with teachers, actually, but with people all over the school. So it's admin, it's faculty, it's staff. Um, part of our entry process is to ask the parent and the child, who are the people you connect with at the school? Who are your champions? Who do you feel comfortable with? Who do you feel safe with? Because it could be any one of those folks. Um, and the idea is that we want to create alliance, you know, kind of across in order to really wrap around the student and support them. This is not, this is really a multifaceted uh, program that relies on excellent, excellent rapport with people who are, who are invested in showing up for these kids. And how is um, Bright connected to community resources? And when we're talking about community resources, please, I'm not talking about DCF. I know. So community resources and where along the line is Bright actually working with the Department of Mental Health? So in terms of community resources, um, part of, you know, we are not new to the area, but we are newer to Holyoke. And so part of our, our job in the next six weeks is to really reach out to the local, so local community mental health resources and connect with them. So that includes not only on the ground outpatient services, but also all of the CBHI services, so child behavioral health initiatives, so therapeutic mentoring, in-home therapy, intensive care coordination. I, not sure what every what all the acronyms that people know, so I want to make sure that we cover right. those. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, the idea is that we would connect with those so that there is um, there is more of a seamless transition. You know, when a kid when it's determined that a kid coming into Bright Services maybe needs some additional external supports that we are already connected and working with um, agencies in the area to provide those supports to families. Anybody else have any questions? No. Um, Mr. Dr. Oh, good. Thank oh. you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, we'll be sure to give you an update on how this progresses. Um, I, at this time, I do want to ask the um, Holyoke High School team um, to f to uh, come to the front and talk um, about their efforts, their instructional work this year. I think there's some um, new um, programs and initiatives that they wanted to share around um, their instructional direction for the school. Um, so I'm asked Dr. Mahoney um, and Assistant Principal Lori McKenna and Associate Principal Lily Newman to join us. So um, uh, I'm really grateful to work with teachers like Bevan Brunel and with students like uh, Michael Ortiz. Um, but I'm day in and day out super grateful for the leadership team that we have on both of our campuses. Um, Lily is our associate uh, principal in charge of curriculum and instruction. Um, Lily's going to give you kind of a big picture about the work that we're doing um, to get at uh, better teaching and better learning on both campuses. And then Lori's going to drill down into two new initiatives um, that she's been very much at the center of designing and leading um, in its implementation this year, our freshman seminar class and our habits of work and learning uh, for our freshmen and sophomores. So with that, I'm going to give it over to Lily, and you're on. Great. Do I need a microphone? All right, so thank you all for a little bit of time to share tonight a little bit of our work at Holyoke High School. Um, there is a lot going on, so every bullet in this slideshow has lots of people, energy, and funding behind it. Um, but we'll give you kind of an overview and then dive in a little bit more deeply to a couple specific initiatives that we're working on at the high school. If I can get the clicker right. All right, so we have many assets that we've been able to build on, and um, as many of you know, I am a former parent of the Holyoke Public Schools. My son went to Sullivan and to Holyoke High School, 
and I joined the leadership team there a little over a year ago um, after doing consulting work with the district and all over Western Mass in turnaround primarily. And so really excited to be in year two and to understand more of the assets in our building, including our amazing students and staff. Um, our students are really diverse and talented and caring individuals. Um, they care for one another academically, supporting each other's success. And also you'll see if somebody is feeling anxious or upset, another student will take care of that student. Um, we recently had a middle school student passing through who was having a really hard time and one of our high school students ran up to him and asked him if she could give him a hug because she felt like she understood where he was coming from. And that's just a small example of the way our students care for one another. Um, and in addition to that, we have real emerging student voice on our campus. Um, our programs across the middle schools and into the high schools are helping students elevate their voice and really um, get involved in what's happening at the school. So you'll see students involved in a full redo of the student handbook and proposed adjustments to our rules in the building, most of which were passed. Um, they're also involved in hiring committees, um, observing demo lessons from hiring candidates, and recently helped us hire a really stellar science candidate who starts in a little bit. Um, and they're continuously joining us in more leadership conversations. We have something that I am deeply grateful for, which is a commitment to a pathway for every single student across every aspect of the system. Oftentimes, schools and districts can be at odds, and I feel like one of the greatest assets we have is really tight alignment and support from the district to our school, and a vision around a pathway for every student that I, as a parent, really wish had been there when my son was here. Um, one high school, multiple campuses and options. We're really trying to think about how to make sure both the North and the Dean campus are rigorous and equitable opportunities for students, but also that we have many opportunities through our Opportunity Academy for students who need a different sort of environment or something that's less traditional. We have interventions and advanced coursework ramping up this year, and we're continuing to refine those pieces so that we can provide that pathway for every student. We have restorative practices and a community acknowledged Palante program at our high school that is a leader in restorative work across the valley. And we also have growing trauma sensitivity work that our staff has asked for and that we continue to provide. Um, and working more and more on culturally responsive teaching and cultivating independent learners. We have a real focus on creating a school that serves the community rather than a community that must conform to the high school. And undergirding all of that is extremely dedicated veteran staff and really engaged and talented new staff. But we have our challenges, as you well know around this table. Um, many of our students are well below grade level. Nearly 60% of ninth and 10th graders came to us in urgent need of intervention. That means those students are at the fifth grade level or lower in reading and 41% in math. We have a real lack of academic habits and mindsets to persevere through rigorous academics. Only 65% of freshmen were on track at the beginning of this year or wrapped up last year on track which means passing all core subjects at our North Campus. We do have, though, around 80%, a little more than 80% of freshmen were on track at the Dean Campus, and so we have assets in a lot of our challenges that we can learn from. We, um, I noticed right away that curriculum and instruction were well below grade level when I came on board a little over a year ago, and teachers were really struggling with how to address the challenges that students had coming to them, but also provide the rigorous high school content that they needed. And so there, w there was no consistent or coherent curriculum either. Um, teachers were creating their own resources, you know, after long days teaching and assessing student work, trying to find something for the next day. Um, a really unsustainable 
approach to teaching. Um, and our, our students were really in this dependent learner mode that um, folks like Zaretta Hammond, who's written about culturally responsive teaching and broad achievement disparities across the country, have brought to our attention. And we noticed more and more that classrooms were very teacher-centered. Teachers did most of the thinking and the talking and the work during the lesson, and students were often passive or sidetracked or otherwise not fully engaged in the learning. And believe me, teachers were trying everything they could think of, but we knew they needed really strong, robust supports. We knew we needed more access to interventions that were social, emotional, and academic so that our students could build the confidence and the perseverance to succeed in high school and also close those skill gaps so that they could really reach that rigorous academic instruction. So there are a couple of specific goals and strategies that we focus on for academics this year in particular. And this was um, underscored by our recent school quality review um, that was completed by the School Empowerment Network. We want to really see all students doing the thinking and the work of the lesson. All students, not some, all. We want to make sure that to create those independent learners who know what their learning requires, who know themselves, who know how they're doing and what they need to do to advocate to close their learning gaps, that we needed teachers and students consistently checking for understanding and monitoring progress. And then we needed to collaborate closely with our staff to review and select and pilot implementation of the highest quality instructional materials that we could find. And we have done a rigorous examination of what's available and what's the most highly rated and are currently piloting the College Board's ELA curriculum in grades 9 through 12. It's called Springboard. And we are using Engage New York for math and shifting to a pilot of illustrative mathematics, which is the um, same curriculum content that the K-8s are beginning to implement. And we've also dedicated our time to increasing the quality and access to interventions. Some specific action steps that we've taken to reach these goals include having really clear classroom look-fors. What does it look like when a student is doing the thinking and work of the lesson? What does it look like when teachers are monitoring understanding with students? Um, our teachers asked us for more models and modeling. They had been working hard for many, many years but didn't have a clear vision of these things. And so we've committed to providing exemplars. We've been taking video of some teachers in our own classrooms. Some of our department chairs have committed to taking on new practices with support from coaches and taking videos of those. And so we've been sharing those videos and capturing other models of great work around our building. And our coaches are doing modeling as well and co-teaching to clearly demonstrate those moments where you can take more of an opportunity to turn that work over to students. Um, and we're committed to relentlessly monitoring progress, and we're doing that in a number of ways. In the moment, during instruction, dur at the end of the lesson, during the debrief with an exit ticket or reflection. We're also doing that in data inquiry cycles where we are working on curriculum in departments, but we're doing that curriculum work by looking at student work and saying, what do our students need next? And how does our next unit in Springboard, which is new to us, help us get at that goal? Um, and we also regularly monitor progress at the larger view beginning of year, middle of year, and end of year with the STAR assessment for ninth and 10th graders. And we're working on supporting 11th and 12th grade teachers to really strategically use the midterm as a data point to monitor progress and ensure the second semester more fully meets student needs. Some of the specific goals and strategies we have around social emotional learning, and maybe this clarifies some of what it looks like at the high school level, because I agree with you, it's super important to pin that down and be explicit. We're refining our tiered behavior supports back to the multi-tiered systems of supports. We've got academic interventions, but we also need those behavioral supports. 
We are working to maximize our restorative justice program and restorative approaches that get kids back to the learning as quickly as possible and have as little as possible removal from classrooms. Um, we've been working more tightly with our counselors and building our awareness and practices in trauma sensitivity and our behavior response system so that we're aligned on how to compassionately respond to behavior issues while also keeping the focus on learning. We've begun implementing Habits of Work and Learning, or HOWLs, and we'll hear more about that from Lori in a minute, to support all students to develop those academic habits and mindsets to become increasingly independent as learners. We've launched a freshman seminar to teach HOWLs explicitly, to build a stronger community of learners, and support freshmen to stay on track and know what great note-taking is and what those skills are of highly successful learners. And we have also been implementing those consistent student self-reflection practices where they analyze their own data and set goals for improvement, again, to increasingly become independent learners who can say, here's the goal I need to reach, here's where I am towards that, and here are some ways that I might um, take next steps to advocate to close the gaps. And so Lori's going to talk a little bit more about the implementation of Freshman Seminar and Howells. Hello, everybody. So um, as we started our work of redesign and thought about how we wanted to change things at the high school level, we realized that one of the things that really was needed um, as we looked at other schools and reflected on our own selves and things that we've done as a school and as a community is that we really needed to create structures within our school where there were smaller learning communities so that students and teachers could really build strong relationships with each other and students and students could build stronger relationships with each other. And so as a result, um, four years ago, um, the Ninth Grade Academy was launched. So we are in our fourth year of implementation. And um, there are still some teachers who started who are still a part of that academy. And I have worked in the, uh, in the Ninth Grade Academy for the last four years. Um, we're starting to see it really um, launch and really start to get some of the um, results that we want from it. And as we're starting to um, do some more work and look at what students need. Um, it became very clear that not only do students need smaller learning communities to learn in, they also need, need some explicit teaching on actually how to do school and how to do it successfully. And um, th so this started with, with the teaming of students. Currently, right now, um, we have three teams at the North Campus in the ninth grade, and there's one team at the Dean Campus. Um, this is really a way to support students and make sure that the adults really understand the needs of the students that are in their classroom um, because a team of adults share the same load of students and they meet on a regular basis to um, discuss the students and their needs and what steps are needed to support them. Um, this year, we're really excited to launch Freshman Academy. Uh, this is a new course that was designed um, for all ninth graders to take. Um, and it's a credit-based course. There are several goals of the course, um, with the large goals being around supporting the students um, as they transition into the first year of high school. Um, that is a really tough transition for many students, and this is a course that helps them get the tools that they need to be successful. It provides students with the academic behaviors they need for success, it helps them to develop the right attitudes and beliefs that they need to be successful in school, in a career, in college, in life. Um, it provides a positive culture um, for the school and to, cre to create a positive climate within the school. And it helps to develop the um, social, uh, social and emotional development of the student. Um, what you see before you here are some sample topics from semester one. Um, this is actually, as I look at this, pretty much semester one of freshman seminar. As you can look, it's, this is a pretty loaded slide right here. Um, so looking at it, it really kind of brings me a lot of pride in what we've been able to support our students with and bring, bring to them. Um, just so you know, it was actually a team of teachers um, along with myself and actually the assistant director of our restorative justice program who worked on this curriculum and created it on our own. Um, 
all of the work is really divided into four buckets, um, study skills and academic success, taking care of yourself and others, um, exploring opportunities, and community building. Um, so just doing a little quick dive into each of these um, with the study skills and academic success. Um, this really provides students with some key strategies that they need to be successful in all of their classes as they work with um, difficult topics, complex texts, and grappling with critical thinking on concepts. Um, so this is really about how do I highlight and annotate a text? How do I... Um, how do I use focus note taking in a class so that I can keep track of what's going on in the classroom? It also helps students to identify, so there's several lessons that helps them to identify what are the habits that make me be successful in school? What are the strategies that I need to do to be successful? And it really breaks it down and has them within the third week of school thinking about each and every class and what they need to be successful in each and every single one of them. Because what works for a kid in math might not actually work for them in English because it's very different. So they really have to reflect on their own thinking and learning and think about what it is that they need to do to be successful. Um, we did a um, survey on the students about which lessons they really liked the most and which ones helped the most. And growth mindset was one of the ones that they felt was really the most helpful, which is awesome to see. Um, what is a growth mindset and, and what does it mean to have a fixed growth mindset, uh, a fixed mindset as opposed to a growth mindset? Um, Students also have a lesson where they learn about right away why are grades important, what do credits mean, and what is a GPA. Um, and this then kind of transitions into um, anytime there's a report card that comes out or a progress report or um, every other week when there's not one of those things, we're getting students to get in the habit of checking their school brains or really doing a reflection about their progress report or the report card. Um, they have a worksheet that they need to fill out that they work with their freshman seminar teacher to look at what they've done, to think about how they got there, and really make some smart goals about what is it that I need to do to improve this or keep doing a great job at what I'm doing. Um, and there's also some structured study halls within there um, that are strategically placed around times where there is going to be a progress report coming out or it, there is going to be a report card and think about what is it that I owe? When should I be staying for office hours? So they're making them, this become a habit. So then when they become a sophomore, they're going to do that school brains portal check on their own instead of having to have somebody um, tell them to do it. And it's great when I meet with a student and I kind of say to them, you know, how are your grades? And I oftentimes in the past, kids would be like, I don't know, um, what do you owe? I'm not really sure. And now as I'm starting to have conversations with kids, they're like, well, this is my grade in this class, and it's this because of this. Because students really need to own it. The adults can't own it for them. They need to own it. And it's awesome for the, to see them starting to own that. Um, taking care of yourself and others, um, it really helps students to think about what are things they can do to help them manage stress. stress. Um, what, do, what does a healthy relationship look like? And what does, what does boundaries mean? Um, what do I do to help me manage a conflict that when I'm in school? Um, so that lets them know about things that they can do, but it also lets them know about different um, places in the school that they can go to uh, get support with that, whether it's RJ, whether it's our student support room. So it lets them know about the different supports that are there, whether it's meeting with a counselor. Um, when we talk about exploring opportunities, so students in the ninth grade, um, midway through the year, will be choosing an academy, the academy that they will be a part of for their next three years of high school. So that's a pretty big decision that they need to think about, and we give them some supports through this course to help them kind of figure out what kind of learner am I? How do I learn? How might that influence influence my choice when I decide an academy. What's the career that I want? What do I want to do after high school? Um, so it allows them, we use a software career cruising that helps them take a learning styles inventory, think about um, what kind of career do I want. Um, in December, we're gonna be having a reverse job shadow where some um, people in different careers will be visiting the classrooms and coming in to talk about them so that can help them start to think about where do they see themselves. Um, and then with the community building, there's some overlap between some of our um, projects. We're going to be having a career research event that we started last year, where after they do this inventory and career cruising, they're going to see the top 
um, five careers that are the best match for them and really start to do some exploring about what does that mean and what kind of education does that mean or what are my next steps that I need to do? What's the income for that kind of job? And then also do some work around um, some college awareness or next steps after college where they're going to do some exploration around that and, and really learn about what they want. Um, so right now, um, we have a freshman seminar team of adults who's working on semester two and figuring out, um, taking some of the feedback that we got from both students and the teachers and figuring out what we want to do in semester two. And um, we're going to be, we're, we're leading, we're having some student-led conferences that we're piloting in, in some of the, um, in some of the sections. And each of the freshman seminar classes has a, a teaching assistant um, who is an 11th or 12th grader who's supporting the work and kind of sharing their own experience or, or maybe helping to lead some of the conferences in there. And um, it was great to hear. Um, I happened to be in one of the classrooms, and it was great to hear one of the uh, – he's a 12th grader right now, and he said, where was this course when I was a freshman? Because I really needed it. So to see some of the older students see what is being offered and kind of get that feedback is really great. Um, the second thing that we're doing is our howls or our habits of work and learning. Um, last year, this was um, a pilot in just the ninth grade classes in semester two. This year, it is being rolled out – um, in all ninth and 10th grade classes. Um, I will say this is still a work in progress um, because this is something that is brand new um, for our teachers. Um, the purpose of this is to really teach um, explicitly what these behaviors are and how to accomplish them. Um, the three habits or howls that we have this year are being ready to learn, collaboration, and responsibility. Um, students get a daily grade in each of their core content classes for this. It's 20% of their grade in a college prep class. It's 15% uh, of their grade in an honors class. This really supports students to figure out um, what this means. If you say to a student in class you need to be a good collaborator, okay, what does that mean? And so this is what this helps to do is to really explicitly tell students and explain to students and show students this is what it's all about. Um, all of the ninth grade uh, town halls that they had um, at the beginning of the year was to celebrate students and their howls, um, students who had done a really good job or teachers were able to recognize that, um, if they were doing a good job with their habits of work and learning, they were recognized for that. Um, and again, just kind of some feedback from last year, we had done a survey um, from students about what do you think of howls? And so the same student answered in um, her survey, I really hate howls. This has really helped me to do a much better job in my classes and do what I need to do. So um, sometimes when you hold students to that higher expectation, they kind of see it as a bit of a challenge or, or maybe um, might push back a little bit. But at the end of the day, they really do appreciate that um, and know that that's what is needed. Um, that what you see here is just... Um, the Howells rubric, um, just the look fors essentially that match up with ready to learn, collaboration, and responsibility. And um, this is what how you can see it in the classroom. So there's specific things that teachers need to do. Um, for example, when they plan a lesson, they think about what the Howells target would be for that day for that lesson. Um, they post it. They unpack that with the students and explain to them, in this lesson when you collaborate, this is what it looks like. Um, throughout the class, they narrate what those behaviors look like and um, use some positive narration when they see students doing the right thing and doing what they need to do for that habit. At the end of class, they debrief it as a class. How do we do as a class with collaboration today? How did you in do individually? Sometimes it might be out loud. Sometimes it might be a personal reflection that the students have to write. Um, because students, what they need to do, they need to be clear about what the target is um, for the lesson with the Howells. They need to be able to explain how they're going to get to that Howells target and how it's connected to the content of the day. They need to show the Howells behavior through the class. Um, and then at the end, they do need to reflect and really own it. Because of, again, if the teacher is just giving them a grade and say, today for Howells, you got a four, but they're never really looking at it themselves and owning it themselves, that's how they're going to make the progress. So that part of that debrief and that reflection at the end of class as well as throughout the class is really key. And that's it. I don't think that last slide was in there. So does anybody yeah. have any questions? No, we, we actually did. It was the, the teacher part that we had. It was oh, bigger. Part is missing. <laughs> but um, 
So it's open for questions. Anybody have questions? Um, Mr. Cushane. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to say that I, I really like um, the idea of getting freshmen um, ready for high school. You know, there, I, I, I had a very similar kind of experience when I got into college, and it was um, just kind of teaching you how to take notes, making sure that you're starting out on the right foot, and I really like a lot of this. Um, I'm curious about um, well, those two things that I'm really curious about. I, I, I've been concerned, I've voiced my opinion many times in front of this council about what happens, our eighth graders are coming to ninth grade unprepared, okay? that. You threw out some numbers that I'm just like, how is this even possible? And I know that we don't hold anyone back in eighth grade. And I think that that puts all of this onto you in the ninth grade academy, which makes me also concerned about, you know, what is, I saw this thing about your college prep versus honors and what are there, what are the teams like? Is there a college prep team? Is there an honors team? Like, what does that mean? So there's three different teams, and each team has one section of honors and three sections of college prep for their core content classes. So they're they're mixed. Okay. So there's no. There's no honors team. There's no right. college prep team. Okay, and there's is there. Um, so all the classes are weighted. How, are there weighted? So classes say within a team team? like so. The first floor team, they would have a teacher would have would teach one section of freshman seminar. They would have one section of an honors group, and they would have three sections of a college prep class of that same class. So a math teacher would have one honors math class and three college prep classes. I'm sorry, I'm not following that at all. Sorry. So you're so kids who are in honors. So you, can you start as a freshman and and. Be in honors classes. Absolutely. Yes. One hundred percent. Yes. Okay. There, you know, I'm very concerned about the number of students that were that were bringing into the program, uh, and and they're able to come through at an honors level. And I'm just I'm just trying to understand the mix. Okay. So, because uh, I'm I'm worried because my my high schoolers, they're in college now, but they were going through while we were transitioning to this, and um, what what I'm I'm concerned about is that we're, we're want to make sure that that we're attracting you know kids to the program. We're going to be challenged, okay, and that's that's good to hear. I really believe in preparing students. I really like the the um, uh, this freshman course because I think it's really important. Even kids that may believe that they are ready, oftentimes are missing some points, and even if they came in as really strong students, they can still. Uh, clearly improve, so I mean, I'm really excited about that part of it. Um, okay, and then I'm just really not clear again on the, what's the difference between a college prep and an honors, like what is, what does that mean? The, the, um, you know what the weight difference is? So I just want to make sure that it's clear that by 11th and 12th grade, our kids are in advanced placement classes. We have a whole slate of offerings. We are offering, as um, Ms. Brunel explained, we are offering capstone courses that have research in the community for real projects, for real purpose. We have many students in early college and dual enrollment. So there's lots of really incredible challenges available to students as they go through. So just to be clear, yeah. we weighted the habits of work a little bit different in honors classes, like just the percentage of the grade that they would be. We thought a lot about how much, and we've done a lot of research as well, about how much behaviors impact academic outcomes and tried to sort of set those percentages in a way that would mirror that. Um, and so we assigned a, a slightly less percentage for Howells in an honors class because generally those students who enroll in honors have certain pieces around the habits, whether it's the motivation, whether it is perseverance, or whether it is actually concrete skills that they have acquired over time such that there's a little bit less emphasis needed on habits to get them to the academic success we want. Okay, so what's, I'm just trying to understand, what's the difference between a college prep class and an honors class? Like it's really about like the level of challenge provided and the level of independence. So the content is the same, the curriculum is the same, but in an honors class, you may be simultaneously reading 
several books independently and composing essays around that. You may, in some of, we have a couple of classes where those, the honor students are embedded within the college prep class and they might be doing, if we're doing a Socratic seminar on a literary text, they might have read additional nonfiction research and be presenting new questions for the class to think about. So it's really about increasing the complexity. Um, if you look at differentiation experts, they talk about a variety of ways to differentiate work for students. So it could mean more reading, longer reading, higher levels of reading, but it also might mean more sources, more complex analysis, fuzzier, more confusing problems rather than straightforward problems. So the honors courses access those sort of like higher levels of thinking and doing um, while all students have rigorous curriculum and content. Mr. Christian, I think like 20 years ago, it would have been the difference between standard and advanced. Yeah. But the standard right. is standard college is college prep. prep. Like, yeah. Yeah. that's right, right. I yeah. just it's, it almost seems like almost reverse. That's why I was like so confused. I was like, okay, college prep used to be, you know, oh, they're going AP stuff, and then honors was a step below, and now everybody the standard is kind of college prep. That's the goal across the board. Okay, sorry, that's, it wasn't clear. And okay, so that was that was that. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Mr. Sheehan. Yeah, I have a couple questions. So just so I heard you correctly, on slide three, um, you talked about that 65% of freshmen were on track at the North Campus. Did you say that 85% were on track at Dean? Is that I think the number is 80, was 81% as our baseline, which was we took the data from the end of the year last year as our baseline for the beginning of this year, and they were maybe 81% on track. <coughs> okay. And then... So on the slides that um, were brought up with the sample topics from semester one, I think it was, I don't have a number, but it's the slide, Lori, the slide that you did. Um, so you had mentioned that you're encouraging students to like basically take control of their own destiny and look in school brains and use that. Are teachers actually updating school brains on a regular daily basis so a student can actually do that? So I, I believe it's a weekly basis that they're required to make sure that their grades are updated. And um, I can guarantee um, that those students in those classes, one of their assignments that they have to have for their uh, binder is one of those um, school brains portal checks complete. So if there was no grades in there, those kids are gonna be holding them accountable. So absolutely. So they are actually weekly. Bi-weekly, bi-weekly requirement. Okay, bi-weekly, 100% of the teachers that work at Hoyle High are making sure that School Brains is updated. That's the goal, that's the expectation. The dates are regularly pushed out to them and they're reminded of them and it's, it's up to each of us as their evaluators and support to check on that. Okay, but that's not really what I'm asking. I said, I, I mean, I know what the goal is, but we have had a major School Brains issue. This is the, probably the, Tenth time I've brought this up that it's not being updated. I mean, there's a difference between expectations and reality. Uh, and maybe this is something for Dr. Mahoney since it covers both of his campuses. But uh, do we know that we are in compliance and is someone checking compliance? You can probably run a quick query to see to make sure there's been updates because, I mean, at a minimum, something would be being updated. It should be being updated. And is it being done? Yeah, I can say for a lot of teachers it is, but we have work to do on all of our compliance issues and following dates and timelines. Okay, so Absolutely. I'll direct this to Dr. Mahoney then. We've talked about this work before that needs to be done. Like, what are we doing to actually be in compliance with this? Because I've asked this question a thousand times at meetings. Dr. Zreich has heard me ask it a thousand times. Like, what are the steps that we're doing to actually make sure that the system that we want students to use and parents to use is actually being utilized by our staff? You can probably take a seat right next to Lori. I have some more questions too that you may. Go. So at this point, uh, uh, checks on school brains uh, and teachers' grade books are not happening systematically across both campuses. So we're not running a report on, on, on the school brains. We are reviewing those when we have our teacher conferences, um, when we're doing goal setting and, and getting ready for the uh, evaluation part of the year. We've just gone through quarter one, um, and uh, you know we're 
moving forward into quarter two. Uh, we can run, and I'll you know, commit here. I haven't committed before, but I commit now that we can run a biweekly report and to see uh, if that's possible. We'll work with Gail Shattuck uh, to get an update on whose grade books have been updated in the last two weeks. Yeah, I mean, it just, it, this conversation has happened numerous, numerous times. I mean, it, it's been a common theme, and it's maybe been different people sitting here each time, but there's been no way that we have ever been able to actually implement this. And it, it's something like, if we are saying that this is a tool, and I know that the students in the freshman academy are looking for it and they need to print it out, but then if it disappears afterwards, I mean, how are we training in these tools if we're not making sure it's actually being checked? Like, if you are, you can talk about it during goal setting, you can talk I, about it during post-conferencing, but I mean, if it's not actually getting done, I mean, we, we cannot be paying for this service and having something that's so easy and the, it, you can hold it in your hand and see how you're doing, that teachers aren't updating it. I mean, so I, I just, uh, your point is well taken. I'm telling you right now, I'll contact Gail Shattuck first thing tomorrow morning and find out how we can get those reports run. We'll look at those reports, just like I looked at reports of who turned in their grades on time for quarter one. Because one of the big issues that, when, when two issues that came in when I was here around school brains was getting schedules done on time before school opened and getting grades out on time when the quarter ended. Mm -hmm. the, and I was very clear from Dr. Zreich, these things have to happen and these things have happened. If someone turned in their grades late, you know, last week, they heard about it from me, CC to all their administrators. And, you know, I'm assuming it's a, it's a one-time mistake, but we are, we are paying attention to grades being submitted on time. We'll now start paying attention on that week, on the biweekly report, if, if we can do that. I mean, uh, they kind of go hand in hand though, right? Like, if your grades aren't being turned in in time, you're probably not updating the system. Well, I, I would just tell you that, you know, when you're teaching 120 kids and you're grading that many essays or you're trying to prepare for three or four different courses and you're trying to be there for students, and there's a lot to do for teachers. So updating grades uh, every two weeks, that's for some teachers who are trying to gather lots of evidence about how their kids are doing in the class, that takes a lot of time. And so, I just, you know, not every teacher is going to do it every two weeks, but we can watch it and look for trends. And where there's a Lori McKenna who's been missing three checks in a row, that's a problem. Where there's a Lily Newman who missed one but is usually consistent on updating her grade book, that's not a problem. That's a conversation. What support do you need for that? Mind if I just say, Devin, just on, on this point, because I, I am with you 100% on this one point as a parent with my kids in the high school, um, I just... This is something that happens where you forget the parent as part of your program. The parents need to be involved, and if they can't see the kids' grades, they can't help you help them. And it just, we, we've had this conversation, as Devin said, I've said it many times because I was in the district, and I know Lori was in the district too. How many times have we changed this program? And we went from a program that a lot of teachers used all the time, religiously, put extra material on there religiously to, I, we were going through months and months where the, it was not up, uh, upgraded and we weren't able to help our kids get on track and figure out why do you have one missing, you got one missing quiz grade that is tanking your entire uh, grade for this semester and it turned out it was a misunderstanding or it was a lost but thing. I, and I yeah. want to be clear that I, I don't, I'm not reporting that we have a problem. I, I'm, I'm reporting that we haven't looked Faculty wide across campus, who's updating their grade books on, on a biweekly basis? We haven't done that. And I'm, I'm saying we can do that. I, we, we've also, at our open houses and our parent meetings, our, our family and community engagement coordinator is there, and our counselors are there to, to uh, help parents you know, develop you know, their, their school brains accounts so that they can log on and say, okay, how's my son Steve doing? Uh, and in and, uh, and that account, you can see daily attendance, you can see period by period attendance, uh, as well as um, uh, your, the, the line in your teacher's grade book about you know, where I am on quizzes, tests, labs, essays, et cetera. And then um, when we met in October when uh, Ms. Anir was presenting, she would be talking about some of the high school data at this meeting as well. You know, we were prepared to have a conversation about some of the accountability data. Uh, we were going to talk about what efforts that the school was making to improve outcomes. I mean, we uh, we didn't. 
I mean, we, were, we we talked about what the school was doing. She talked about what the rest of the district do, was doing. I talked a little bit about the high school data. Right, but it, she said we'd cover it more in November. Well, what they were going to cover is what they're doing to address their concerns around data. That was what their their focus. That th this conversation. Okay. I just think it's part like this whole presentation was void of any of the accountability data. I would have thought there would have been some of the correlations to how the school is done in progress. I mean, Boyokai declined in almost every subgroup um, last year. I mean, it just, I thought we'd be having a real hard conversation about that. Maybe we can do that in, in January and talk about that more, but, uh, but I think that there's some disconnect. Yeah, I'm ha we're happy to, do, happy to talk more about the specifics yeah. around the data. I mean, the, the idea was to give, Val gave an update really about the K-8 uh, yeah. schools um, and the work they were doing, and this was really... Could it have been better connected? Sure. It could yeah. be. But absolutely. I agree with that. I think maybe to January, give some time and have a much deeper dive into some of the data because I have a lot of questions about sure. some of that. Sure. Okay. Um, any other questions? Mr. Colomar. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, student involvement in the classroom, uh, rather than just sitting there and writing your essays or whatever you want to do. Is there any program where the student gets up and expresses himself talking to the teacher, talking to students, get, getting them more involved in the, in the classroom setting? Absolutely, that's the whole piece around cultivating independent learners and turning the thinking over to students. So it ranges in everything from how teachers pose questions and wait for student responses or how they insist on three students responding to each other before the teacher engages. Also to in-depth Socratic seminars that our students will engage in um, sitting in a group and leading conversations about a critical event in history or about a text or getting up in front of their peers and presenting or getting out into the community like our students went to the Hamden County House of Corrections and observed arraignments and trials the other day. So we have our work to do to increase that and that's one of our areas of focus. Um, but the curriculum that we've selected helps us do that as well by putting students as leaders of discussion and as presenters and as the ones leading projects. So that's very much part of our work. Does this reflect on their grades rather than, rather than if they <coughs> send in their report and there's nothing on it, on the report, but you know because the student is getting it because he's getting up and speaking and letting you people know uh, what's going on. you have a thing you want to say? So um, Dr. Zreich was able to sit in on uh, Jake Lee Santos's um, uh, portfolio presentation last Thursday, and, and, I, and, and Lori and I sat in today on Owen uh, Pace's, um, where the students had to present and defend the quality of their work over the last quarter to an audience of their parents, uh, fellow students, uh, teachers, and, and administrators. And so we're, um, these, these portfolio presentations are one part of trying to get students to be able to be uh, metacognitive about their progress as learners and, and how, they're, how they're moving forward and, and what they have to do to get better or stronger and where they're doing a good job. Um, so we are really trying to encourage um, teachers to, um, Lily was uh, coaching some teachers the other day uh, in classroom discussions. Oftentimes that's not really a classroom discussion. It's students watching, students talk to the teacher. Um, and so uh, Lily's you know, uh, trying to use a, a rule of three before me. So if a student has a, if a teacher asks a question and a student answers it before the teacher says anything, the goal is to ask two other students what do they think about that other student's response or what does that response make them think about or do they agree or disagree kind of piece. So we're really pushing for kids to listen and talk with one, each other, with one another far more than just to listen to the teacher. Oh, Mr. Cushane? Um, just one other how, how are we doing with the um, school improvement council meetings at the high school? Um, we've uh, put out uh, two requests for um, 
family uh, volunteers to uh, join a school improvement council. Um, we've heard from one um, uh, family. We're going to be, uh, we've actually identified three other um, parents uh, that we're going to tap. Uh, Miss uh, uh, Serrano and I uh, look to uh, bring that group together the first week of December. We're, we're also inviting students and teachers to sit on that as well. Any other questions? I just, um, I'd like to make, I, 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 at our next meeting, which I know is. Uh, no, we, we said um, January. January, no, no, but I'm going to bring in the next meeting. I think it is fair to ask for an update of where we are in percentage of teachers that are updating every two weeks. I can bring those percentages to you and share those with you. This is for many of the the three people who are sitting up here, this has been a long-standing conversation. It wasn't a very clear expectation early on. It is now a clear expectation, and I think there needs to be accountability for people who are either who are not fulfilling their responsibility of entering grades um, in a timely fashion. So we can get you the data of what that looks like across both campuses. Can I also say that um, I take our results very seriously. I know we all do, um, and we've done a lot of reflecting on them. And I would love to know, if it's possible, what some of your pressing questions are and other members of the committee um, as we prepare to be sure that we're bringing the right information to you in January. Can I, can I, yeah, go uh, ahead. Mr. Shan? Yeah, I, I would just say I'm concerned that there's uh, one of the things there's been a decline in participation rates in MCAS. Uh, looking at from prior year, uh, I, I think that's an issue uh, with looking at that. And I think that the, the decline in almost every subgroup that went through there uh, is overall, I mean, I know there were some um, no changes and some mild increases around uh, some mathematics growth. I know that science, there was a little bit better uh, numbers there. But I just, I mean, it, it was somewhat drastic, I, I think, that of how much uh, things declined. Uh, accountability wise and I yes I know there's a new accountability system and I know that the tests are different but still like apples to apples comparison when looking at other similar urban districts like Hoyoke you didn't see such sharp contrasts that went through the same um, type of change uh, I also think that we saw some declines around um, AP and SATs overall uh, when looking at that and there's no metric that I was looking at that really showed I, I mean the decline everywhere kind of connected and I just Looking at that, and, and I know that AP participation was down from prior year because we're urging for uh, more uh, dual enrollment. And I will fully say I think dual enrollment is more the way to go uh, rather than taking a gamble on one test and hoping you get college credit. I think that dual enrollment is the way. And if we could do that for more students uh, than AP, I, I fully support that uh, because I'd rather a kid walk out with three college credits than the chance of eh, maybe I'll get them or maybe not after doing a whole year in the class. Uh, but I just think there was declines everywhere, and I think we need to have some conversations of the whys and the hows and some targeted, uh, like we talked about some of these interventions, uh, but I don't know if we really went into depth about what we're doing around those interventions and some uh, tiered support for students, and I think that'd be helpful for the committee. Absolutely. And actually, if we want to wait till, I mean, graduation date is probably out by February, right? Uh, graduation data will be out in... Uh, probably February's meeting. I mean, I'm okay waiting till then to do sure. it all. At I mean, it all yeah. kind of connects. Like, instead of doing it twice, I mean, if it makes more sense to wait till the gra the graduation data comes out, I mean, that's yeah. Dropout and graduation come yeah. out in January. That might be helpful. Whatever. I mean, whatever you and sure. the team. Yeah, I would just one other thing just to point out about the data. You have to look at the district's high school data, not Holyoke High's data, and it's uh, it's complicated because they. <coughs> Uh, they did not include the dean students, um, the former dean students' tar targets in the way they did Holyoke High's data. The best, the, the way to look at our high school data is to look at the Holyoke Public Schools district data mm -hmm. for high school. So it, it, there's, you'll see that there's two different numbers, yep. and it has to do with the fact that the two schools were merged. It doesn't mean that there wasn't decline. It just, the decline was different when you look at the high, the district's high school data versus Holyoke highs. 
My last comment would be that I think February would be great because we'll also have middle of the year star That's data true. that we can say, how are we progressing this year? There are a lot of trends in turnaround that show that when new teams come on board, sometimes results drop in the first year as new initiatives are launched and then steadily rise. And you'll see that across the country in turnaround districts, um, in addition to all the changes in the accountability system and, and DESE's attempts to make sure that that SGP maps on to previous SGPs, although we know that even the fact that students were tested on computers and may not have always scrolled properly can affect their results. And we saw historically that when students took new MCAS tests on paper in the same format, they performed better when they switched to the computer um, method. Um, and so that's just one small detail, but I absolutely agree with you. We we should bring a full explanation of what our understanding is and what we've done to address it. And with middle of year star results for ninth and 10th graders, we'll be able to see where we're headed this year with the initiatives that we've been working on. Any other questions? Well, thank you again for coming and presenting and we'll hear more from you guys on in February. So moving along to superintendent receiver correspondence. Uh, just um, I have uh, you have a one pager that has some updates. I, um, I just point out um, that um, I, I mentioned to Mr. Collimore on Thursday there is a um, a ceremony for uh, not Thursday to, uh, Wednesday at two o'clock there is a ceremony for varsity athletes or all athletes fall athletes in their participation and recognizing those athletes at Holyoke High School North. So if anybody would like to attend, I did not include that on this list. It's Wednesday at 2 o'clock at uh, Holyoke High School North um, to celebrate our any athletes who, who participated. Um, and then you have a series of um, events that are upcoming. Um, I, do, I will call out that the Special Education PAC is meeting this Wednesday. Uh, the topic is the annual topic uh, that they uh, discuss is bullying. Our first... Um, ELL PAC meeting, we, we hold those quarterly, is um, scheduled for a week from tonight at Kelly School from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, and I'll just stop there. You have all the other information. Um, in front, there's an equity coalition meeting on Thursday evening at Enlace from 5 to 7 p.m. All are welcome to attend. Um, and then I, you do have uh, some notification about uh, Morgan's quarter one update, which was presented to the Board of Ed um, at their October meeting. You have a copy of that in your packet. Um, and oh, finally, Mildred's pointing out that the uh, to highlight the Holyoke Transitions Academy holiday fundraiser is Thursday evening, December 5th um, at 5.30 p.m. at the Elks. Um, as you know, we do not have school on Wednesday uh, before Thanksgiving. Um, both our our offices will be closed as well as schools are closed the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And the Friday after? For Black and the Friday. Friday after. That's correct. All right, excellent. So moving on to new business. Um, is there a motion to approve the so minute? Moved. Great. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion passes. Any old business? Any announcement? Oh, Mr. Colomar. Under old business, I'd just like to congratulate our volleyball team this year for uh, not only just winning all their games, but their sportsmanship on the court and off the court. At every game they went to, they really were great <coughs> in going over and congratulating the other team for winning the playoffs. And Ohio High School playoffs is very, very important. Not just not just for volleyball, but for every sport. You make the playoffs because you performed not only on the court but off the court. And of officials, principals, <coughs> teachers should be very, very proud of the sportsmanship of our students. Mm -hmm. And I really think that we should recognize every one of our sports programs. Absolutely. 
I, I just uh, um, I just wanted to make a mention. I should have done this at the beginning of the meeting that uh, we had the passing of Beth Westcott, the um, food service worker, um, in the la um, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. And I just want to take if we could just take a moment of silence to recognize yes. her passing. Thank you. All right. Um, is there any other announcements or? Oh, Mr. Sheehan. Um, announcing this because the city clerk asked me just to uh, make everyone aware that the uh, swearing in for uh, elected officials is Monday, January 6th at 10 o'clock at City Hall. Um, if for some reason you are unable to attend make arrangements with the city clerk to make sure you get sworn in because we'll be having our first meeting that next day. <laughs> and um, I want to give a big congratulations for Ms. Felisano Sims as being <laughs> um, voted in as chair of the urban um, division for the MASC. Yeah. You're welcome. Wonderful. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> motion adjourned at 838.